All rise. The court is now in session. Judge Newman presiding. Good morning. Anything before we bring the jury? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, a couple things. First of all, uh, we're going to ask you in a minute to advise uh, Alec Murdaugh on his rights concerning testifying. Before we do that, though, I'd like to renew all previously made motions concerning the financial crimes that were allowed in by Your Honor's ruling under 403, race, just die, and maybe 401. Um, and advise the court that we would renew our motion to exclude that testimony. And now, because it was included, um, uh, our advice to Mr. Murdaugh would have been different in terms of taking a stand if that material had not been allowed under motive. But since it was allowed in um, under 608, we would object to it. Um, and uh, I just want to put on the record that our advice had that not been allowed in, our advice as to whether to take the stand or not would have been different. I want to put that on the record. I'm asking you to strike the financial information, and we perhaps would need a recess then to give him different advice about what to do. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Ward. Uh, Your Honor, obviously we've addressed this issue. I know that uh, I'm happy to go into further detail. Considered all of this and admitted it, and we've stayed within those boundaries. And I'm not aware of any reason why, in, in the middle of this trial, we would uh, change the rules. Um, but I would just be reiterating as I made your honor before. Right. Anything further, Mr. Harper? No, your honor. Well, the court has determined that the uh, so-called financial crimes and other um, other crimes and or bad, bad acts have, have determined them to be relevant, material, and admissible, uh, having given the 403, 404 analysis, as well as the uh, race geste analysis. And the trial has proceeded with many witnesses testifying uh, regarding um, these issues. And uh, the court will not change course during the trial and provide any special exception to um, Mr. Murdaugh with regard to uh, testimony regarding the um, matters that the court has already determined to be admissible. Uh, with regard to the advice of counsel, um, uh, Mr. Harpoolin, you stated for the record the basis for your advice. Uh, of course, a defendant's. Yes, sir. Your Honor, um, under, first of all, all the financial information, misdeeds, are in the record, basically. I mean, the amounts, um, very specifically. So, um, at this juncture, they, they, two things happen. One, he has not been convicted of anything uh, in regard to financial crimes. So normally, they couldn't ask him um, about uh, those crimes because he hadn't been subject. They're not. They don't either. He hadn't. It's got to be a crime that carries a year or more. Those kinds of things. It meets none of that. So then you go under 608, um, and it's character evidence, um, and it's going to be. Uh, uh, fair game. We disagree with. Uh, there's a Fourth Circuit case that seems to restrict it a little bit, but we disagree with he with the, with the, with the, the process whereby he couldn't come in if unless he was convicted. He takes the stand, and they're going to ask him extensively about each and every one of these events uh, in um, an effort uh, to you know to commit character assassination. This is what we warned about. Um, you've told the jury it only goes to motive, um, and this obviously goes well beyond that and vitiates Your Honor's earlier ruling, or at least it gives them two grounds now to argue why it's relevant. Um, and our advice 
was had that information not already come out, uh, we would be sitting here with no financial misdeeds in the record. Um, and uh, we believe that uh, the jury, uh, high likelihood of the jury uh, acquitting uh, him because they haven't proved motive. They haven't proved there's no forensic however, no confession, no eyewitness. Uh, it's all, as you say, uh, in denying our motion for a directed verdict, it's circumstantial. Um, this is just a naked effort of character assassination to influence the jury that he uh, has committed these financial misdeeds or misrepresented other things. Um, and as a result, no matter what charge you give the jury, we're fearful um, that he, if he hasn't explained any of that, um, that uh, they will hold it against him. And um, again, it all goes back to your original ruling uh, as to motive. Um, I'm not sure they're even arguing motive after Mr. Tindley's testimony and after Dawes Cook's testimony, both of whom said there was, wasn't a storm coming on Thursday, that, the 10th. Um, so again, our advice would have been different had Your Honor not allowed. Uh, I mean, if you would uh, strike all that testimony and tell them to disregard it, we uh, in all likelihood wouldn't stand or not advise them to take the stand. I just want to make that record. You just restated what you've previously put on the record and what you have argued throughout the trial. and. And uh, I certainly understand and appreciate that. Well, and this, this, it's compounded this new problem if he takes a stand. And, and we think, with all due respect, and I'm not arguing again what we argued uh, a month ago, that what's going to happen is we're going to spend the next day or three with the, the state going through the minute details of each one of these offenses. Um, we've already, in my opinion, uh, this is, you know, this is a Bernie Madoff trial. This is um, this is all about financial misdeeds, not about. No, that sounds like a good jury argument. If you're the one to make the argument, um, but I'm not convincing you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's an argument that you can make to the jury. I, I've ruled on the issue, and yes, uh, I do not know what the uh, questions that the state intends to ask. I, I cannot forecast the next three days as you have just done as to. Uh, every minute detail the state will seek to introduce and all rights are preserved as to any and all testimony and anything that is objectionable that, um, that that you all wish to object to it the court will rule when those objections are made your, in your honor I appreciate that all we're saying is if they have carte blanche to go into the minute details and talk about who the victims were and, and do all of that and do that it's going to take a week more, especially with our objections, and then have to redirect them on that. And haven't we wasted enough time on financial matters? All right. Thank you. I'll give you an opportunity to uh, respond if you desire. Your Honor, again, I, the court has ruled. I don't think I need to address it any further. Yeah, when a defendant takes the stand and testifies, uh, he has no right to set forth to the jury all facts which may be favorable without exposing himself to cross-examination. Whether or not um, a defendant testify is solely the right of that defendant. Um, the court makes no recommendations pro or, quant or con. I have no um, role other than advising the defendant of his rights and to ensure that he understands his rights so that he will make an informed decision with regard to testifying uh, after consultation with counsel and anyone else he might want to testify, uh, consult with. Uh, do you wish me to uh, engage in that colloquy at this time with Mr. Murdoch? Your Honor, I think it would be good for you to engage in that colloquy now. We have one short witness before he would testify, if he continues to want to testify. All right. Uh, Mr. Murdoch, if you'll come forward and stand in front of me, and Madam Clerk, if you will swear him. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. 
At this time, I'm going to explain to you certain of your rights. If you do not understand anything, I say, please let me know, and I will explain it in greater detail. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, we have now reached the stage of the trial in which you are presenting your defense, uh, and you have the right to claim the protections given to you by the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. This amendment states in part that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. And this means that you cannot be required to testify. You do, however, have the right to testify on your own behalf. However, no one can make you testify. Whether or not you testify is a personal right, and no one can waive this right except you. If you decide to testify, you will be subject to the same rules that govern other witnesses, and you may be examined and cross-examined on any relevant issue in this case. If you decide to testify, the decision on your part must be freely, voluntarily, and intelligently made with knowledge of the protections given to you by the Fifth Amendment and the consequences of your decision to testify. As I understand that you have no convictions involving dishonesty or false statements or any for any crimes punishable by more than one year imprisonment. But as it relates to any other relevant issue as determined by the court, you may be examined or cross-examined on any relevant issue. Do you understand? I do, yes, sir. If you decide not to testify, I will instruct the jurors that they cannot give the fact that you did not testify any consideration whatsoever, and that there is to be absolutely no prejudice to you because you did not testify. It is left entirely up to you whether or not you testify. You may talk with your attorneys, Mr. Harputlian, Mr. Griffin, Mr. Barber, Ms. Fox, family, friends, or anyone else but the final decision will be left entirely up to you. Do you understand what I've explained? Yes, sir, I do. Do you have any questions whatsoever as to what I've explained? No, sir, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, and you've talked with your lawyers about whether or not you've testified, and Mr. Harputley has just suggested advice he's given to you. Uh, the court has no comment whatsoever as to whether you should or should not testify. Uh, but do you, do you wish to confer with lawyers some more about whether or not you should testify? No, sir. I don't need to talk to them anymore. Have you made a decision as to whether you're going to testify? Yes, sir. All right. And what is your decision? I am going to testify. I want to testify. All right. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Honor. Your Honor, we'll have one short witness before um, Mr. Murdoch. Very well. You will bring the jury.
present, sir. Sir, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Day number 23. The defense's case, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, the defense calls no one to you. your step there. Place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you. You'll come to the witness stand and have a seat, please. The microphone is very sensitive and you have to get quite right up on it. But if you would state your full name again and please spell your last name, please. Nolan Tutin, T U T E N. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please tell the jury a little bit about yourself? Um, I grew up in Hampton County. Um, grew up around Paul and, and Maggie. I went to school at Wade Hampton. Uh, played sports with Buster growing up and just were lifelong friends. Okay. What do you do? I work in the timber business. Okay. Um, and do you know Alex? I do. Okay. And how long have you known Alex for? Uh, pretty much my whole life. <laughs> Did you spend a lot of time with Alex and his family? I did. Okay. And how would you describe your relationship with Paul? Um, he was one of my best friends. Um, I mean, considered him like a little brother to me. Um, we were really close. Uh, how about, tell the jury a little bit about Paul. Paul was one of those guys that would, I mean, you could call him at the drop of the hat and he would come. Um, I mean, he was, you know, there for you always. He call you nonstop all throughout the day, every day. And uh, I mean, he would do, you know, whatever he could for you, whenever he could for you. And How often did you talk to Paul? Every day. Every day. How often did you see him? A um, couple times a week, most weeks. Okay. And when you saw him, where would y'all be? Um, I mean, it depended. He would come to my house. I would go to Moselle. Um, you know, I would see him on the boat. I mean, we would just go hunt together, fish together, just do whatever we really felt like doing. Okay. And um, other than hunting and fishing, what else did you guys do together? Um, we hung around Moselle. We farmed at Moselle. Um, you know, whatever we felt like doing, really. Okay. Um, and when you were with Paul outside doing these activities, did he have his phone with him normally? Most times, yeah. Okay. And did he ever put it down? Um, he did sometimes. Not a whole lot. I mean, it was either in his hand or in his pocket, but if he had something in his hand, he would, you know, set it down either in the truck or somewhere close to him. I mean, it would be within reaching distance. Okay. Um, what was your impression from the time you spent with the family as to how they got along? Um, I mean, they all had a, a really good relationship, I felt like. Um, I mean, when I was around, there was always kind of laughing and, you know, a good relationship, good family relationship. Did you have a nickname for Alex? Big Red. Okay. Um, and how would you describe the relationship between Paul and Alex? They had a really good relationship. Would you say that Alex was patient with Paul? He was. Um, now, you mentioned that you guys hunted together. Are you familiar with the types of guns that Paul had? I was. Okay. And um, did he ever use a 300 blackout? He did. Okay. And what's your understanding of where he got that? Um, Buster and Paul got two for Christmas one year. One Buster had a black one, Paul had a tan one, and they were at Moselle, and then Paul's went missing or, you know, got stolen or whatever happened to it. And then there was just the black one at Moselle that we used more or less. Okay. Um, when you were at Moselle, what did you do with Paul? Rode around, um, you know, played around at the house, messed around at the sheds, you know, we would go ride the buggies, ride in the truck, you know, go fish, go hunt, go farm. Um, when you rode around at Moselle, what vehicles would you ride in? Um, it really depended, honestly, what was closest to get into from the house. It was, you know, sometimes my truck, sometimes Paul's truck, um, sometimes golf cart, ranger, it, whatever we felt like riding. Um, did you ever ride in the black Ford F-150? I did. Okay. And are you familiar with where the kennels are located? Yes. At Moselle? Okay. 
and if you and Paul were at the house, would would you guys typically walk to the kennels or would you drive down there? We would never walk. We would okay. drive or ride something. Okay. And um, were there ever times where you noticed Paul with guns in his trucks on my Zelle? All the time. Did he have the 300 blackout with him in his trucks? A lot of times, yes. Okay. And were there ever guns left in the shed by the dog kennels? Um, they were sometimes not a whole lot, but okay. they, they were, you know, sometimes left there and then picked up later. Okay. What about the hangar? Um, same. Um, now, Maggie. Tell me about Maggie. She was, uh, she, she was a very sweet woman. She would, you know, do whatever. She treated me like I was one of her own. Um, she was just really, really sweet woman. And would she go down to the dog kennels? She would. Okay. And how would she get there? Um, it just depended, really. She would drive her car sometimes. She would walk sometimes. She would ride her bicycle. She would ride a ranger, a golf cart. It, you know, however she felt like getting down there. Okay. Um, let's go to the day of June seventh. Okay. Um, walk me through that day. Um, that morning, I got up and I talked to Paul either over the weekend or Friday or one of those days when we had talked about CB had sprayed the sunflowers. And so I had gone out to Moselle that morning and rode by the sunflowers to see if they were actually dead yet or not. And I noticed that they were dead. So then, you know, Paul and I talked, um, I don't know, around 10 or 11 that morning and about kind of coming up with a plan about how to get them plowed up under and, and replanted. So then I went to work and stayed at work all day pretty much. I, yeah, I, we were supposed to go out that afternoon and start plowing the sunflowers under. And I got stuck at work late and, and talked to Paul throughout the day and I wasn't gonna make it that night. And then, so I went home after work and then uh, I got the call around 10.30 or so, 11, sometime around there and came back to Moselle and, and, and you know, everything had happened. When you talked to Paul that morning, what, if any, understanding did you have as to where he was? He was in Okatee. He was working for John Marvin at the time. Okay, and then you guys made plans to meet at Moselle that That's afternoon. right, yes. Okay. Um, when you called him on the way home, what, if any, understanding did you have as to where he was? When I talked to him on the way home, he was driving from Okatee to Moselle when I spoke to him. Where were you when you got the news about Maggie and Paul? I was at home. Okay. And did you go to Moselle? I did. Okay. Did you see Alex? I did. How would you describe him? He was pretty distraught. He was, when I got there, um, he and I saw each other and we, we both kind of walked towards each other and he, he gave me a hug and just started crying and, and told me they were gone. That maybe all I have begged the court to talk about. Um, your plans to meet up with Paul on June 7th. Right. Was that plan to address the issue you had seen in the sunflower with the sunflowers? That's right. Okay. No further questions. By the state. Nolan, good morning. How are you? Good. How about you? Doing well. Nolan, we've. Um, We've met a bunch of times, right? Yes. Prior to trial, we've yes. met Colleton, we've met elsewhere. We've had quite a few conversations, is that fair to say? We have. <clears throat> and uh, you've had a lot of conversations with, with law enforcement also. I they have. were sometimes there at the meetings. <laughs> yes. Um, you, were, you were as close a friend as Paul as there could be, is that fair to say? I feel like that, yes. Okay. And um, I just want you to say again, uh, was he was the kind of guy that if you needed something in the middle of the night, you, you could call him. Yes. He was, was he going to be there for he you? He was going to come. Flat tire side of the road, Paul's there for you. He was there. Okay. 
Um, you, you also, I think, <clears throat> and, and Maggie, I think you referred to her as a second mom. I did. Kind of, they adopted you into the family. You were treated like one of the one of the group. Is that yeah. is that fair to say? That's right. Um. And uh, what what year did you graduate high school? Uh, 2014. And what year did was Paul at Wade Hampton? Um, he didn't go to Wade Hampton. Oh, what year was he graduating high school? Sorry. I want to say 17, maybe so, 17 or 18. So you were a little older than Paul. That's right. He was the same age as my younger brother Nate. And your younger brother, I know we already heard we uh, we it's Nathan too. That's right. right? Yes. And, and he testified um, previously in this trial. That's right. Okay. So your your years in high school would actually align with Busters. more Busters, and Paul was a little younger. Than you. That's right. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned that Paul was an avid cell phone user. Is that is that is that fair to say? That's fair. He used it all the time. Yep. Which may be part of the reason why he was so responsive when you needed something, because he always was there to answer the call or respond to a text. Is that That's fair right. to say? Yeah. Um, do you uh, do you consider yourself someone that has a, a fair amount of knowledge about firearms? I feel like it. Yes. You're, you're, are you an avid hunter? I am. And you've had a lot of experience with firearms yourself? I have. And a lot of experience with the family's firearms? Yes, sir. Gain, gain kind of a knowledge of what, what people tend to use or favor? Yes, sir. And uh, is it fair to say that, um, well, first, let's, before we go there, let's, let's talk about the 300 blackout. Paul's 300 blackout, I think you just testified to um, that they received as a Christmas gift. Right. Now, uh, Buster's when they received it buster's 300 blackout was was what color it was black and paul's 300 blackout was what color it was like a sand color okay and you um hanging out with paul and i'm going to talk about somewhere in like 2017 2018 did you go to a halloween party with paul we did right. um did you actually ride with him i from my recollection yes and it wasn't uncommon for Paul to have his kind of favorite guns in the car with him. Is that fair to say? That's fair. And on this occasion, when you went to this party, did Paul have that, that 300, his tan 300 blackout with him? He did. But this is back in like 2017, 2018. It was a while ago, yes, sir. Before COVID. <laughs> That's right. The new, the new designation, before right. COVID, after COVID. Um, and uh, tell us what happened. What happened that night? Um, I mean, we were at a Halloween party, and we had been around Moselle most of the day, and, you know, we left, and then later on, the gun was gone. The gun was missing, whether, you know, whatever happened to it, you know, it was, we no longer had it. <laughs> so, it was there before you went to the party, and then y'all come back, and it's, it's out of the car. That's right. Now, this was a, this was a really nice rifle right it was it was a fairly expensive rifle and and the scope on it is a, is a very expensive scope that's right um so it wasn't like it was misplaced it, it was do you believe it was stolen i believe so yes <clears throat> all right and then going to guns did uh did paul have a, a shotgun that he favored he did was it the uh and have you paid attention to any of the trial I've watched some, yes. Okay. And is it, uh, without going ahead and rooting through the guns, is it that camo camo in color um, Benelli Super Flag Eagle 3 that, that the state has in evidence? That's right. That's that's Paul's that shotgun? Was, that was his, the one he favored the most, yes. And then um, the did Paul also have a 300 blackout on him at all times? He did, most so times. So did, what did Paul do after his rifle was stolen? What did he use then? When his rifle was stolen, he more or less took busters as his own so he, he he started using busters is that because buster really didn't use that very much buster was in school um you know either in wofford or in columbia so he was buster came to moselle a fair amount but paul was there more and so paul just you know used it as his own <clears throat> and then um, buster had a shotgun he'd favor i think we'd already heard about it but is it a is it a benelli super black eagle model two that's right and do you know the differences between the, the Super Black Eagle models? I do. Then I think your brother already testified to that, but there's there's markings on the on the shotguns that you can look at and tell if you know what you're looking for. That's right. And then um, I believe Alex favored a Super Black Eagle model one. That's right. He so, either shot the one or the two. Okay. So we have a one, two, and three models. Right. For the same 
the Ali Super Black Eagle, but models one, two, and three. That's right. And those are all 12 gauges typically that was, was used That's as right. a kind of general use. Mm -hmm. um, I think you also mentioned that about guns being left down at the kennel area. You said it was occasional. Is that is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Um, they weren't stored down there, right? That's right. Permanently. Nothing was stored down there. No, nothing was stored down there. And it was usually if guns were left, would it be mostly in just the hunting seasons? That's right. Okay. It would either be during, you know, the hunting seasons or, you know, if Paul was cleaning out his truck, um, you know, he would. And when are the hunting seasons for, like, deer and, and duck the, and turkey? When are those hunting seasons? Um, deer season is typically in the fall, sometime August to January. Duck season is, you know, around Thanksgiving to the end of January. And turkey season is... March 22nd to May 1st, somewhere around there. Were you, um, and you've spent a lot of time at Moselle, I think you, you already yeah. talked about that. Were you, were you around before the, um, at, how many entrances and exits are there at Moselle, the property? Two. Were you around before when there was only one entrance and exit? So when there was only one entrance and exit, the, the main exit, entrance and exit, where was that one? That was by the kennels. Okay. And is that actually where the uh, mailbox is? That's right. And I think packages are sent that way they would typically go to the shed to the hangar and then at some point in the future a second exit was created um, where some brickwork was done sort of leading from the house is That's that right. is that accurate as well that is um, when, and uh, you all spent a lot of time at the kennel area it's kind of a, the hangar kennel area we did uh, it's kind of a good collection point for whatever y'all were doing whether it was working on the t the heavy equipment there or or hunting and getting ready for things is that that's correct a fair thing to say there's a good collection point yes sir. for y'all um, and i think out there there's also a processing shed for for there if you killed anything yes sir. and if you all are down there and um you know say say maggie or or alex were were at the house and they, you know, obviously knew you were down there. Would they tend to come drop by before they would leave just to see if y'all needed anything? More often than not, yeah. All right. And knowing Paul as well as you do, is it, and we've heard a lot about him, is it fair to say that he was a, he had a lifestyle that was just fairly unpredictable absolutely i mean he, he lived he, he was traveling the state whether it was columbia charleston the low country that's wherever he was he was everywhere right that's correct and he actually kept clothes in many different places just for that reason because he was such a traveler he did um so you talk to him almost every day right that's right but, uh, but for those that maybe weren't so close to him, it, it would be fairly hard to even know where he was going to be on any given day. That's, that's right. Unless you kept in frequent contact with him, right? That's fair to say. He yes. was everywhere. Any given day during the week, he, who knows where he could be. Mm -hmm. Fair yes, to sir. say? Um, all right. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to talk to you about June 7th, 2021, and that's a day, that's the day you lost uh, your best friend. That's right. And that's a tough day for you, is that right? It is. Um, you talked to Paul that day on the phone. I did. In the, in the morning and afternoon times, is that, is that accurate? Yes, sir. And uh, I know you just testified to it, but walk us through, uh, walk me through again, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I believe y'all were talking about the sunflowers. They died. We were. And uh, you, 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 uh, you often helped out on the farm. Is that also fair to say? I did, yes. Meaning farm-related stuff, tilling the ground and planting seeds and all that stuff. That's right. You were pretty active in the maintaining of the duck ponds and the corn fields for the, for the hunting purposes too, right? That's right. So if Paul needed something, he'd, he'd typically, he'd call on you. That's right. He'd call on you to help out. Yes. And is that what happened on leading up to and on June 7th? Yes, it was. Um, you know, he knew that I was riding by because 
typically when you spray something, it takes a couple days before it actually takes effect. So it happened, CB sprayed them, I want to say Thursday or Friday. So we really couldn't get a good idea of what was actually done, the harm that was actually done until a few days later. And I was going to be riding by Moselle that morning to go to work. So I just swung in there to, to, to check on them and see what it was where we could come up with a game plan on what to do. And you had pretty free use of the property, meaning you, you could you could show up and come and go as you please. That wasn't weird, right? That's right. So the fact that you went there that morning to check on stuff, that's that's actually pretty normal for, that's right. for you? Okay. And so you show up on uh, that morning and check the sunflowers and, and they're they're dying. Is that, right. that right? Yes, sir. So a decision was made that y'all would have to um, – and why do you need sunflowers? What are the, what's the purpose of those? Um, they attract doves. Uh, you know, we plant them, you know, kind of corn, sunflowers, corn, sunflowers in the dove field, you know, to have dove hunts. So it's important to, for, for hunting purposes, it's important to maintain a, a dove field. You call it the dove field That's or right. the sunflower field. Yeah, it's, it's a good attractant. Yeah. Um, so the decision was the decision made then to, uh, to till the field and, and replant the sunflowers. That's correct. Uh, it wasn't too late in the year, in the season. You could, you could still get some good growth out That's of it. That's right. Okay. And this is something you're pretty familiar with and you've done a number of times before with Paul? Yes, sir. All right, so uh, what do you relate to Paul then? Um, I, I talked to Paul, told him that they were in fact dying and we had to restart. So he and I had talked about coming up with a game plan, meeting up that afternoon at Moselle to go ahead and get the tractor hooked up and, and begin plowing them under. And uh, ultimately, you weren't able to make it that day. Is that is that That's true? That's correct. Okay. What what did you have going on? I got hung up at work around the Columbia area. So the plan then became we're gonna we're just gonna do it later, That's right? right? We'll do it some sometime later in the week. Yes. Now, <clears throat> leading up to um, these events, you received a uh, a Snapchat from Paul around 7 p.m. Is that right? Sometime around there, yes. Sometime in the evening time. That's right. Um, and tell us what that Snapchat was. Snapchat's a, like a video image that someone can send you? That's correct, yes. And uh, tell us about what that Snapchat was. It was a video of the the John Deere High Boy sprayer. Um, one of the cylinders on the back to spread the boom to spray was leaking pretty bad, so he was sending me a video to show me how bad it was leaking. Okay. And a tiller is a, is a piece of farm equipment, is that correct? What is it? Sorry? Repeat your question. Was, is a t you said a tiller? Is that the a high is boy. High boy. Is that a piece no. of uh, farm equipment? It is. And is that the thing you, you would use then to um, drag the plow the fields? That's what we would use to spray. Spray. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. And it was leaking some sort of fluid, meaning it was maybe broken. That's right. All right. Um, now you've, uh, in, in all the times we've met, the n number of times, um, did, did you have a chance to listen to uh, that, what, we, what we call it kind of the kennel, vi kennel video? I did. Um, and did you, uh, when, when listening to it, did you identify the voices on that video? I did. Having known the family, what voices did you hear on that video when you Paul, heard Paul, Miss Maggie, and it, Mr. Ellett. <laughs> All right, down at the kennel area too. If you're down there at nighttime, I assume you've been down there around the nighttime, the hangar kennel area. Um, it's actually pretty fairly well lit area if the lights are all turned on. Is that That's true? Correct. So not only is there the hangar lights inside the hangar, but then there's lights on the outside of the hangar as well. Is That's that, right. Is that true? Yes. And is it true then also that the kennels are have lights, both fan lights and overhead lights? That's correct. So if you're down there in the middle of the night, even though there may not be any, you know, street lighting or anything like that, the, the kennel area and the hangar are all brightly lit with like fluorescent lighting. Yes, sir. And you would, would you be able to see um, the lighting if you were at the Moselle house? Would you be able to look down if it's nighttime? Would you be able to look down and see the, the well lit area? You could, yes. All right, so we're on, on June 7th. Um, what's the last communication you have with Paul? Um, that phone call. Um, 
and uh, you go to bed. Think, sorry, go ahead. The phone call in the Snapchat. And uh, you then go to bed that night thinking it's just any other night. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and I think you testified to it, but you were you were woken up at, at what time? It was around 10:30, um, between 10:30 and 11. My mom had called me, and uh, she had heard something had happened at Moselle, so I tried to call Paul and text Paul and didn't get a response, so I got in the truck and, and rode over there as fast as I could. And at the time, were you living um, fairly close by? I was living um, I was living closer to Almeida. It was probably a 20 to 25 minute drive to Moselle. When you arrived at the scene, what entrance did you go to initially? Initially, I, I was coming down Moselle Road, and I noticed all the first responders over towards the kennel area, and so I pulled in there, and they wouldn't let me in. So then I backed up and came in through the brick columns and made my way around. Okay. And uh, when you arrived, what, what did you what did you observe? Oh, when I got there, there were um, a, a lot of first responders out, and I could see two bodies laying, one by the by the corner of the shed and one by the feed room door, and they had sheets over them. And uh, by the time you arrived, uh, law enforcement had already cordoned off the area? They had. But you could, um, where, where the tractor equipment was housed you could kind of stand around back there that's correct and uh, even though it's set further back you could you could still see sort of the, the scene yes um, who was who was there with you when you arrived um, when I arrived it was myself Alec Randy Ronnie Crosby um, Mark Ball and think that's I think that's it at the time people started coming when I got there a lot of people started coming showing up and uh, I, I know you testified to it and it's it's uh, obviously understandable but everyone's pretty upset right yes um, and uh, when you uh, did you have a chance then to interact with with Alex I did and is he here today he is is he sitting at council table right there in between his lawyers? He is. And uh, I think you said you hugged. Is that right? We did. And what what thing did he repeat to you twice? The boat wreck. The boat wreck. The boat wreck. He, that's the, the, the thing he said to you. That's right. And did he also ask you to get in touch with Rogan? He did. And you know Rogan Gibson? I do. Friends with him as well? Yes, sir. So the two things he says to you there is, two of the things he says is the boat wreck. I think he said the effing boat wreck. Is that right? He did. And get in touch with Rogan. Yeah, it was a little while later, but yes, he asked me to call Rogan. Okay. the court's indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. Read that right. Um, you mentioned that Paul would clean his cars out down by the kennel area, his right. trucks. Um, are you aware that he took his truck in to be serviced I that was. Friday? Yes. Okay. And he cleaned that out before he went? Yes. And um, if you're at the house in Moselle, mm -hmm. can you see in detail at night what's what's happening at the kennels? You could just see the lights, and you could tell that the lights were on, and you could see the roof. But that's really about all you. So could just see. the roof and just the lights. That's right. Okay. You could you, you noticed something was down there, but you weren't really able to tell exactly what it was. Okay, and going back to June seventh, you went out there in the morning for the uh, field that's right okay and did you see the black Ford F-50 up at the house I did okay mm 
Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Nothing yet, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Ladies and gentlemen, we have you go to the jury room for a short break. Please do not discuss the case. Everyone be seated. Uh, Mr. Harpooling, do you need any additional time to confer with Mr. Murdoch? Uh, he indicates he doesn't need to talk to me. That hurts my feelings, but uh, we don't uh, we don't need um, right. any, any break. However, Your Honor, he does need to visit the restroom before we start this process. All right, we'll take a recess about 10 minutes.
Oh, you do. Absolutely. You may bring the jury.
Thank you. Ma'am, you will not be able to sit. You cannot sit there. You cannot sit in the jury box. You may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch, wishes to take the stand. Watch your step. Yes, ma'am. You'll place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. You swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You'll have a seat on the witness stand. Adjust that microphone. And if you don't mind stating your full name again and spelling your last name. I'm Alec Murdoch, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. Good morning. June 7th, 2021, did you take this gun or any gun like it and shoot your son Paul in the chest in the feed room at your property off Moselle Road? No, I did not. Mr. Murdoch, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out on June 7th or any day or any time? No, I did not. Mr. Murray, if you take a 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body. No, I did not. Did you shoot a 300 blackout into her head causing her death? Mr. Griffin, I didn't shoot my wife or my son any time. Ever. <laughs> Mr. Murdoch, is that you? On the kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th, the night Maddie, Maggie and Paul were murdered. It is. Were you in fact at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th and told them that you stayed at the house after dinner? I did lie to them. Did you lie to Agent Owen and Agent Croft on the follow-up interview on June 10th that the last time you saw Maggie and Paul was at dinner? I did lie to them. And in the interview of August 11th, did you tell Agent Owen and Agent Craw, did you lie to them t by telling them that you were not down at the kennels on that night? Yes. Alec, why did you lie to Agent Owen, Agent Croft, and Deputy Rutland about the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid thinking. Uh, and it, it could be anything that, that triggered it. It might be a look somebody gave me. It might be a reaction somebody had to something I did. Um, it might be a policeman following me in, in a car. Um, that night, June 7th, after finding Mags and Paul, 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 don't talk to anybody without Danny with you. All my partners were just repeatedly telling me that. I had a deputy sheriff taking 
gunshot test from my hands. I'm sitting in a police car with David Owen asking me about my relationship with my wife and my son. And all those things coupled together after finding them, coupled with my distrust for SLED, caused me to have paranoid thoughts. Normally, when these paranoid thoughts would hit me, I could take a deep breath real quick and just think about it, reason my way through it, and just get past it really quickly. On June the 7th, I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't think I was capable of reason. And I lied about being down there. And I'm so sorry that I did. I'm sorry to my son Buster. I'm sorry to Grandma and Papa T. I'm sorry to both of our families. Most of all, I'm sorry to Mags and Papa. I would never intentionally do anything to hurt either one of them. Ever. Ever. Did, did you continue lying after that night, did you not? Well, once I lied, I continued to lie, yes sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. But once I told a lie, I mean, I told my family, I, I had to keep lying. Alex, tell the jury what happened on the evening of June 7th starting when you met up with Paul? <clears throat> I'd been at work that day, uh, a, a, a fairly normal day. Um, you mean start in the morning or? Sure, start in the morning. Um, it was just a regular morning. Maggie was leaving to go out of town. Um, she was, she was going to a doctor's appointment, and um, she had some stuff to do at Edista, where she was uh, having some work done on our house at Edista. Um, so, but Maggie was there that morning. Uh, she went to leave, and, and she told me she was doing these things. Um, I always, always asked Maggie to come back home and stay with me um, but anyway Maggie had left she did her thing um, I went to work did work I learned from Paul Paul that who's Paul Paul that's Paul my son Paul Paul my son Paul murdered and, and, um, and your name for him was Paul Paul yeah we I mean we called him Paul Paul okay go ahead I'm sorry and um I mean, Buster, Maggie, I, I pretty I called him Paul Paul or Paul Terry, um, but Mags called him Paul Paul, Bus called him Paul Paul, um, a lot of people called him Paul Paul. <clears throat> but anyway, I learned about the, I had known that CB, the guy that worked for us, had sprayed the sunflowers. I, I, I knew about that, but I, I'd been out of town. Um, I didn't know they were dead. Paul let me know they had died. So we had to replant the dove field. That, that's the dove field, which 
the, the dove field is just a big, it's a big social part of, 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 of having property. People would come and it's just a social big part of it. So the dove field was a big deal. So when, when the sunflowers got killed, Paul was, we knew they were dead, Paul was coming home. And I learned that early Monday morning. And did, um, and we'll, we'll catch back up, but at some point in time, did you meet up with Paul? Yeah, after work, I met Paul Paul at the, at the property. And, and, I, and we're going to back Phil and talk about more of the day, but I just want to focus in on that evening right now. Okay. When Paul gets to the property, what do y'all do? First thing we do is we go to the Dove Field. And, and, we, and we look at the Dove Field. And, um, well, how did you get to the Dove Field? Uh, he had come in uh, my brother's truck. We got in my son Buster's black pickup truck. We called it Buster's truck or the black pickup truck. You've heard it called too. But I, I call it Buster's truck. Okay. So you're in Buster's truck and you, and you go to the Dove Field. Tell the jury what else. Well, that's the first thing we do. We, we go to the Dove Field and we look, and it was clearly, it, it didn't, you could tell they were, I mean, you could tell they'd been sprayed and you could tell they were dead. Uh, I mean, they might have still had a tiny bit of light, but they were dead. So we knew that. So we knew we had to replant the whole field. Um, so that didn't take but a second. Um, but after that, Paul Paul. We just rode the property. We spent time together. We, we, just, we rode around and we spent time together on the property. Did you go to the duck pond? Oh yeah, we went, uh, we went to several food plots. We went to um, Single Oak Stand, we called it, which is across the road. Um, I know we went to the bridge stand. We went to the um, we went to the duck pond where we stayed for a minute and did you um I, I can remember the duck pond specifically because I had helped Paw Paw plant the dove field and, and uh, the corn in the dove field. So sunflowers, corn, sunflowers, corn. And I had helped him plant the sun, the, the corn in, this, in the dove field. Paw Paw had planted the duck pond by himself, and he's making a really big deal to me about how much better the corn was doing in the duck pond than it was in the dove field. But we stayed there for a little while. We rode, we were at the cabin for a little while. We rode around the cabin looking at it. No cabin is what? That's, um, it's just a, a, a little small, it's, it's truly a cabin. It's a, it's a four room uh, structure. It's, it's got a little living area, a little kitchen. And it's got two little bedrooms and one little bathroom. And it's what you've heard talk about where the kids stayed some summers. And, um, and is that what the jury has seen some overhead pictures? It's, it's right there on Moselle Road? Yeah, it's, it's, right, it's right up on Moselle Road and, and it's very close to the um, the, the, the driveway that goes to the shop and the kennels. Did you spend any time at the shop, you think? Oh, yes. I mean, the shop was, I mean, that was sort of um, the hub. That, that was the main place. If you weren't at the house, you might be out going to a, this field or this food plot or this duck pond or, or, or this part of the, the river, but the, the, the shop, is it, where the kennels were located, you know, that was, you were always there. Something was always going on there. You're always doing something there. That's where all the tools were. That's where all the equipment was kept. I mean, that was, that was the main hub. Right. And so we were there that day. I mean, there was a point in time where we unloaded the bulldozer that, um, that, that had been on a different part of the property. It was on a trailer. We lo unloaded it and sprayed it down real quick. That was just one of the many things we did that day. One of the things the jury's seen, um, Alec, is, is a Snapchat video of you and, and doing something with a tree. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, and so what, what was happening there? 
that's just part of when we were we were riding that that particular location where that was is at a food plot that that we called uh, sawtooth oaks and it was named that because there were some sawtooth oaks that were planted there that you can't see in the, in the picture but uh, what that tree is at all these food plots there's an area where it, it, it's not as big as the field but it's like a field where you plant um, vegetation for for wildlife like it might be cowpeas or soybeans but you plant and then there's a feeder to, to, to attract deer then we planted these little fruit trees on, on these stands and what you see me doing is fooling with a fruit tree that I'd been tending to it, it had fallen over I had straps on it I had strings on it that were holding it up one of the strings popped I undid the other string and it was falling over and Papa was laughing at me trying to get it back upright and that was it was just a fruit tree that I'd been dealing with for really for years and, and, and it wouldn't you, stand up straight and were you and Paul having a good time at that point you could not be around Paul Paul you could not be around him and not have a good time were you were you close to Paul He couldn't be any closer than Paul Paul and I and Buster and I were in awe. He's just a wonderful, wonderful. And it's one of the things you enjoy doing together with just riding the property? I love doing anything with Paul Paul. It was an absolute delight. But yeah, one of the things, I mean, Paul's passion, I mean, Paul was passionate about a lot of things, but that property was really a passion of his. I mean, he loved to do, he loved to work it. He loved to work the fields. He loved to work the food plots. He loved to hunt. I mean, he, he'd work on the roads. I mean, he would, he would work on all of it. I mean, he would work on the structure. I mean, he, would, he, he worked on the whole property. It was it was his passion. So on the e evening of the seventh, I mean, that jury's been in, inundated with data from various different sources, but sure, j just ballpark. Can you, I mean, knowing, you know, what we know now after reviewing everything, but roughly, when do you remember Paul getting there and you getting there, starting to ride the property? Now that I've had the benefit of, of, of seeing all of these records, um, Paul Paul got home, I, I believe, a little bit before 7 o'clock. And I got home a little bit before him. I think the details have been that I got home around 642 or 645 or something like that. And Paul got there you know, very quickly thereafter, and then by 7 o'clock. So you rode the property for a while. Um, do you remember uh, when Maggie arrived? Yeah, it was uh, it was later than that. It was eight or after eight. I think it was after eight and looking at the records, a little bit after eight. And and do you remember um, do you remember her arriving or where you were when she arrived? I believe that I was at the shop when when she came through, which would not be unusual for her having been away. Uh, if Blanca had gotten the mail or somebody had gotten the mail, maybe not. But if somebody had not gotten the mail, it would be perfectly normal for her to pull through there. And I believe she did pull through there that day. And, and Paul and I were at the shop, I believe. And then what, what did you do after Maggie arrived? Maggie went to the house, and I know that. Um, but shortly after, however I learned that Maggie got home, I went to the house when, when Maggie got home. And I left Paul at the shop. So, uh, and what did you do when you got to the house? I saw Mags, talked to Mags, um, and I took a shower. Um, the, the clothes that we saw in that Snapchat video was, uh, is that the clothes you had on, on, at work that day? Yes, that, those are the clothes I had on at work that day. And the, ju and the jury's seen you in, um, in those clothes and, and what's, 
On, on June seventh, how tall were you, and how much did you weigh? Um, on June seventh, well, I'm I'm six a little I'm a hair over six four, right at six four. On June the seventh, I was about two hundred and sixty five pounds, two sixty four, two sixty five. And um, and this was in June, uh, June seventh. Yes, sir. You know, when you're outside riding around and doing, do you get hot and sweaty? Absolutely. I mean, Paul and I had done some things. We we we. we Unloaded the bulldozer, cleaned the bulldozer, we'd fooled around. Yeah, I mean, I sweated. I was, you know, I was heavy. And uh, taking prescription pills also makes you sweat worse, or at least taking oxycodone makes you sweat more than you normally do. So was it unusual for you to take a shower when you got back to the house? Not at all. And that, when you... After you took a shower, what did you change into? I changed into the clothes that you've seen in this trial. Shorts and the shirt. Okay. When you got out of the shower um, and changed clothes, what did you do next? I went back out where Mags and Paw Paw were, and, uh, and what were for they dinner. What, what's uh, going on? Max had, as you've heard, Blanca had prepared dinner, but uh, it had been cooked earlier. Mags had fixed, she, I know Mags had fixed mine and her plate because I didn't fix a plate. She may have fixed Paw Paw. Paw Paw was eating and Paw Paw was almost done eating by the time I got back out, which also wasn't unusual. I mean, Paw Paw was always on the go. I mean, he, he never, sat still and you know he'd sit down to eat but then he's going on to his next item and uh, so then maggie and i ate and do y'all eat the table do you eat the den what, what's your normal habit uh, we would do both but i mean when we ate at the table it was really sort of more formal or, or, or not formal but just more of an organized thing our normal what we would normally do on a regular evening is we would eat in the den in front of the TV. And that's where we ate that day. I, I ate on the couch, the table. Maggie had a little um, uh, a TV tray that she kept over there. And, and, and Paw Paw would usually sit in a recliner and, and eat off of the ottoman. Was the TV on? Yes. Was that normal for the TV to be on? Yes. TV, if, if we were in the house, the TV was on. So what, what happened next, Alan? Uh, Papa moved on doing whatever he was doing. I, I don't know if he was in the gun room doing something or he was in his room doing something. Or he was outside doing something. I, I actually thought he'd gone to the shed, but in looking at, to the shop, but in looking at the, the, the benefit of having these records, um, that we have. I know he was still at the house or somewhere around the house doing something, but he wasn't in there with Maggie and I. Um, but uh, Maggie wanted to go to the kennels and uh, I had eaten dinner. I laid back on the couch where I was sitting. Uh, Maggie wanted to go to the kennels and she asked me to go. And, and I, didn't, I didn't go at that time. I didn't want to go. Why, um, why didn't you want to go? Uh, it was hot. Um, I just had a shower. Uh, I knew I'd end up doing more work, uh, sweating more, and 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 the, the dogs is always a chaotic scene, and I just didn't want to go right then. Well, let me ask you, what what had you done the the previous days, like Friday and Saturday and Sunday? Um, start with Friday, or yeah. go backwards. Yeah, yeah, start, start with Friday. All right, just, on just, that. Just briefly. So it's 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th. So June the 4th, uh, my dad was in the hospital in Savannah, Georgia, at, at Memorial Hospital. And I went down uh, to visit him Friday afternoon, and I stayed with him in the hospital. I, sp I spent the night there, you know. He was real sick. I mean, he was having a hard time. Um, Did you get much sleep Friday night? 
No, I mean, I had a, they, a, a real sweet nurse found me. At first, there was just a hard chair in there like this, but a, a nurse found me a soft chair, sort of like a recliner. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure I slept, but I didn't sleep. You know, I, I didn't get a night's sleep, no, sir. And then Saturday and Sunday? Um, Saturday, uh, we had plans with... Um, with um, Buster in Brooklyn. I've heard about Brooklyn. It's Buster's wonderful little girlfriend. And Mags and I had plans with them to meet them in Columbia to go to the uh, South Carolina. Uh, it was a regional baseball tournament. And South Carolina was playing Virginia, I believe. So when I got back from Savannah and, and met up with Mags, at some point, we, we, we headed to Columbia. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot going on in between there. We headed up to Columbia and met Bus in Brooklyn. And then, and you stayed, did you stay in Columbia Saturday night? We did, we went to the ball game. And I remember it was an evening game. Um, we, we went pretty early and tailgated. Maggie had, Maggie had reconnected with a college friend um, who coincidentally had married a college friend of mine, um, and they had a son that played for Carolina. He was a first baseman uh, and a really good little player. And we met them and tailgated with them, and, and, it, and it was a lot of fun. They had a lot of the parents of the players that um, were playing for Carolina, and uh, it was just it, it was it was a, it was a fun time. We tailgated and then we went to and it was a night game so we went to the game and the game got over um you know it was fairly late into the evening and after that bus and brooklyn and mags and i uh believe we went to the restaurant in the hotel where we were staying but we went had dinner and and and, and then bus and brooklyn went home and of course, Maggie and I went to our room. And then get up the next day, and was there another game? Another game the next day. Um, that's right. And, uh, and then you, after that, you head back to Moselle with Maggie? Yeah, we went to the game. Um, that's right. Mags and I go back to um, Moselle. To Moselle. And the jury's heard about, I think, Ms. Rass talking about you bringing Krispy Kreme donuts to your dad? Maggie loved her. She, she spoiled my dad and always, I mean, always taking him something. My dad loved sweets and, and she and I picked up donuts and took uh, Krispy Kreme donuts uh, to him. And then um, y'all both spent the night together at, at Moselle on Sunday night. Did you both spend the night at Moselle on Sunday night? Yes. And then the seventh was a work day. That's right. It was a Monday, Monday, June the seventh. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'll rephrase it. Oh, was, I'm sorry. Was Monday the seventh a work day for you? Yes. Okay. And and I just wanted to give that background. And so moving forward to when you testified previously about Maggie asking you to go to the kennels, were you tired? Oh yes, I was tired. And you had just had a shower. Just had a shower. And um, and you said that, well, did you go with Maggie to the kennels no. immediately? No, I did not. What did you do? What did she leave? Yes, she did. She left and Paul Paul was gone. Do you know how she got to the kennel? At the time I didn't, but now looking at these condensed records, um, and, and, and understanding the timeline is clear to me that she rode with Papa. Okay. And uh, and did you stay in the house? Yes. For how long? Not long. I laid back on the couch, put my feet up, and like many times when Maggie asked me to do something that I didn't want to do or didn't start out doing, I changed my mind and decided I'm gonna ride up there. And I did. And how, how did you get to the, to the kennels? I went on a golf cart. Uh, was, it, was the golf cart at the house, the main house? Yeah. 
It was, and it was there most of the time. And when you got down to the kennels, what was happening? Uh, it's just what I thought it was. Um, it, it was a little bit of chaos. I mean, it was clear to me that uh, Max had just let the dogs out. Um, the two dogs that were out were really her pet dogs. One is Grady. You've heard about a black lab. That's Grady. That's Buster's dog. And the other is the yellow lab that you've heard about. That's Bubba. Uh, Bubba was mine and Maggie's dog, but it was really mine, Maggie's, Bus, and Pawpaw's dog. It was a family dog. Um, but Bubba's the dog I hunted. Um, I mean, Maggie loved Bubba. She loved Grady too, but I mean, she had a special place for Bubba. But anyway, when the dogs first were let out, the first thing they would do is they would run. You, you, if you look at the overhead um, picture that you've seen, there were planted pines right behind the kennels. So you got the kennels and the, and, and the chicken coop sort of form an L shape. And in, in that L was some planted pines. First thing the dogs would do is go out in that um, kennel and, you know, Bubba, and, 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 and Grady, I think, learned this from Bubba, but Grady would do it too, but Bubba had to mark every tree. I mean, he, he, he would go and he'd do a little number on this tree and that tree, you know how dogs do, and it's marking his territory. Um, and, and so that was the first thing those dogs did when they came out. When I got there, those dogs were in that area. So that's why I believe that it hadn't been long before they'd been let out. Um, Grady was chasing guineas, um, which was a normal thing to do. What, what are guineas? Uh, guinea fowl is, a, a guinea fowl is like, um, it's like a chicken, it's a domestic bird that, you know, we had them, I, they make a lot of racket. It's like a, you know, I know this sounds silly, but it's like a, a guard bird. Um, because anytime, you know, they just make a lot of racket anytime anything unusual is going on. If anything, if anything disturbs them, it could be a person, it could be somebody driving up, whatever, they're going to make a lot of racket. So um, Grady's chasing the guineas. Um, you know, Paul's fooling with um, Rogan's dog, Cash. Um, Maggie's just kind of standing there watching the dogs, which is normal. And, and they were in that place as... As the dogs are out longer, they branch out more. Um, but at that point in time, they were, they were right there. So that told me they hadn't been out um, a long time. Bubba, Bubba catches a chicken. Um, I'm talking to Maggie for just you know, a short time before Bubba catches a chicken. I take the chicken put it when Bubba Bubba didn't chase these dogs didn't chase the chickens to kill them and they didn't normally kill them they did kill them sometimes but it was about the chase with those dogs and 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 they were proud when they caught one you could just tell by the way Bubba would prance to you when he brought the chicken to you he was proud that he had caught it but he wasn't trying to kill it and so most times the chicken wasn't dead and that chicken wasn't dead um, but a lot of times they would be stunned and they would be just real lethargic. So you had to take the chicken and you had to put it up somewhere where, you know, the chicken could be by itself for a minute and, and it would eventually, usually, you know, come back to normal and go on about its, you know, whatever a chicken does. Did, did you get the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? I did. I took the chicken from Bubba and I put it... Um, on, on top of that now, now we've seen you know this video of Paul um, with cash Rogan's dog did you know did you know that was going on what, what do you remember about that about yeah I, I knew Paul was I knew Paul was fooling with um when I pulled up on the golf cart Maggie was standing back sort of where the driveway would be um, it, it sort of runs out at the feed room, um, storage rooms, what we call it, it's been called the feed room. Um, but it sort of ran out. Maggie was a little bit further up where she could see back in that angle where the dogs were. 
Paul was fooling with um, Rogan's dog back towards the kennel. If I remember when I first got there, Paul was more in the driveway, but then I knew Paul was in the kennel fooling with cash, yes. But did I know what he was doing? I didn't know exactly what he was doing, no. Did um, you? I knew he was fooling with his, I knew he was fooling with his tail. Well, was, was cash in the kennel when, when you pulled up, you think? Not when I first got there. Okay. Um, did Bubba or Grady have any uh, collars on? Yes. Which, both dogs, one dog, do you remember? I don't know about Grady, but I know Bubba had on his, what we call a tracking collar. Paul, for his hunting dogs, um, Paul had a system, a series of tracking collars. And I think there were five, it might have been six, but it's a tracking collar um, that had a, a device that would tell you where that collar was. So that, was, Bubba was bad about you know, he would, he would stay close for a minute, but then he would take off. And he especially do that on Maggie. He would, he would take off and run. Um, and so he had on a tracking collar that if he did that, you could, you know, you, you could know, okay, he's, you know, a half a mile down here. It, it's not going to follow him, but so far, but it would follow a good long distance. So you could go get the dog. Um, if he ran off, which Bubba frequently would do, especially when it was just Mags and Bubba. Um, and so Paul, Paul probably would have been the one to put that on Bubba. So you've got us where you've gotten the chicken out of Bubba's mouth and put it up on a doghouse or something? I believe, I believe what I put it on, and I don't remember this, but I've seen pictures and all this, and I saw the chicken sitting on top of the, um, what looks to me like a portable dog crate. Whatever, wherever it was sitting on there is where I would have put it up there. You know, I mean, reason to believe anybody else moved that chicken, and it ultimately, that chicken did die. And um, what did you do after you got the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? I got out of there. I, 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 I left. I went back to the house. All right. Well, look, before we do that, um, We've seen the dog kennel video with Cash and, and Mr. Davis, and we slowed it down for him. Do you see the water hose in that video on the ground? Do you remember seeing that? Uh, yes, I do. Was the water hose out? And Obviously, um, in the video, but can I, I don't specifically remember that, but I can look in that video and see it. Right. But that's not something that I noticed. So, but you've seen it in the video here. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. And then the two dogs were out. Absolutely. Bubba and Grady. Okay. And then you, you head back. How did you get back to the house? The same route. I mean, the same route I'd come on. I came down the driveway, made a left on, uh, you, you saw my route um, in the car. I, made, I, I drove that same route question was obviously wasn't clear enough what were you in a vehicle you walk had, what mode of transportation did you use to get back to the house same way I came I went back in the golf cart and, and it is the golf cart if you remember that Mark Ball <coughs> testified that he saw where we normally would park it you pull up pull along the, the, the front entrance and it either you come in from the left and you'd go just past it and be on the right or you'd come in from the right and you'd be just past it on the left. And that's where I got in it and that's where I put it back. Did you do anything else um, before leaving after you took the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? No. We've heard about Bubba being stubborn. How long did it take you to get chicken out of Bubba's mouth? Well, Bubba could be stubborn, but Bubba would listen to me and uh, <laughs> And, and, and another thing, when Bubba had on that collar, one of the other features of that collar was... What did Bubba have on the collar or was it Grady? Bubba had on the collar. Bubba had the collar. Bubba, I know Bubba had a collar on, and I'm not sure about Grady. Okay, go if, ahead. If I'm I sorry. misspoke on that, there's no question about it. Bubba had on a collar. I assume Grady did too, um, but, but I didn't, I, I didn't, even though I saw Grady, I didn't notice for a fact that Grady had on the collar. Okay. But he probably did. 
So makes long, sense to me that he did. How long did it take to get the chickens out of nah, the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? It didn't take it didn't take long. Number one, Bubba's coming back there to show me, hey, I caught this chicken. So he's not running from me. He's proud of that fact that he caught this chicken. So I mean he's he comes right up to me. Um, Bubba was really strong, uh, but you know, you just you, you take your thumb when the dog's clenched and his mouth's a little bit open, all you do is you take your thumb and you push his gum in really tight against those sharp teeth and his mouth opens right up. Took the chicken out and put it on, I believe, left. the portable dog kennel. And then left. And then I left. Maybe then leave, okay. And did you go back to the house? I went straight back to the what, house, to the air conditioner. And what did you do when you got back to the house? I lay down on the couch. And then what? Well, I mean, was the TV on when you went back? Yeah, the, I mean, the, 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 the TV never got cut off. So you went back to the house, you lay down on the couch, and then what happened next? I'm not, uh, I'm not positive I dozed off for a minute or didn't doze off for a minute, but uh, I got up off of the couch uh, and I was, I, I made up my mind I was going to visit my mom. Had you spoken to Barbara Mixon earlier in the day? I did. And I talked to Barbara most days. If I didn't see her, I talked to her. And what was your understanding of, of your mother's uh, condition on late on the afternoon of the 7th? She was agitated, which she got agitated uh, when my dad, you know, I mean, we were putting my dad in the hospital. I mean, he had a lot, uh, over the 18 months, two years, I mean, my dad was in the hospital. He was in the hospital a lot. And my mom, I, b I believe my mom knew when my dad wasn't there because, I mean, she would get agitated. I mean, that's just the only term you can think of. She'd get agitated. She'd, she'd, she'd cry a lot. She'd, um, she'd be fussy when she normally wouldn't be fussy. Uh, I mean, she was, I know Alzheimer's patients are unpredictable, but I'm convinced she knew because it happened frequently. And Barbara Ann told me, your mom's agitated. You need to check on her. I gave her medicine. She's resting. Um, so it wasn't anything urgent. Um, but she's resting. So what, what Barbara would do, and Barbara could handle her, Barbara could handle her better than, I mean, my mama, we all love Barbara. My mama loved Barbara. My mama could get, I mean, Barbara could get my mom to do things that nobody else when she fussed for anybody else, including me or my brothers or my sisters, Barbara could get her, you know, in, in, in order. And, uh, but Barbara had given her medicine and, and to, to settle her down and calm her down. And, and that would sometimes make her go to sleep for a little while. But then she'd be agitated when she woke up. The, um, so did you go check on your mom? I did. Um, did um, where did you park when you got there? In the, it, you you saw the pictures. There's two exits off of that uh, deck. One of them to the right. One of them straight out that back door. I would have parked to the left. If if you if you're coming down these steps, if, if these are the steps, it would be to the left and back over there. All right. Um, which is where. I always parked, or where we always parked, anytime you were going in that entrance. All right, I'm, I'm gonna stop there and um, ask, Doug, if you don't mind pulling up State's Exhibit 524, which is the GM OnStar data, and it's a slide 38, um, which is in evidence. Can, can you, can you see this uh, the slide with those dots? Yes, sir. Alec? I can. I can. And the and the red dots here at the um, that seem to be joined. Where, where is that in relation to your 
parents' house. Where the arrow is? Yes, sir. All right, that's back in the area where I'm talking about. All right, so if you look in this picture, all right, you see the, you, you, you see the open area with the green grass? That's the, that's the front door. Okay, yeah, right, right where that circle is. That's the front door. The, it, if you look at closely at the house, you can see a big dormer right in the middle of the roof. That's right over the front door. The white thing to the left of the house, that's like a parking pad where the, where the driveway ends. And there's a parking pad. That, like, so you go to, if you follow the driveway all the way to the house, you're going to run straight into a carport, all right, by the, by the carport door. Just to the left, before you get to the carport, is this area that you can see here. That's, that's part driveway, mainly parking pad. All right, I'm going to, um, Doug, if you'll pull up Defendant's Exhibit 130, which is in evidence, please, sir. Yeah. And, and from this photo, can you point out roughly where, where you normally, where you park that evening? All right, this is, the, this is the entrance to the right that I'm talking about. There's an exit and an entrance. Uh, right in front of that door that you see there. So if you came down those steps, walk to your left, would be down there would be where I parked. Oh, would, you, would you have parked on the grass? Uh, you get on the edge of the grass back there. There's, there's some grass there for sure, but it's not, it's not the area up here by the house where it's sodded and sure. this, this grass that you can really see in this picture. So. It, it may be on the edge of the grass, yes. In, in relation to the satellite dish, um, are you looking at this photo, are you to the right of that? Yeah, you'd be to the right of that satellite dish. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and I believe was, that satellite dish is right on the edge of the, um, you know, there's a, there's a hedge and like you, you see the, I don't know what you call it, a border, like a, a, a border where the grass ends and the flower bed or whatever it is starts right I think you can't see it but I think that satellites probably close to that border all right well let's um so it'd be to the let's right another, of that in this picture Doug uh, we pull up a defendants exhibit 134 see if this is a <coughs> so yeah. is, is the door that you're talking about that's uh, it the, the, the stairs that are those the ones where you would enter Right. That these are the steps that I used that night that we always used. And, and one of the reasons being is my dad, this, this door goes into what we call the breakfast room. The breakfast room leads right into the kitchen. And so straight through this door, all of the breakfast room is kind of to the left. That door goes straight through another door way. There's no door there, but it's like a, just an opening. It goes into the kitchen. Immediately to your right of that entrance into the kitchen is the entrance into where my mom and dad's rooms were. So you, if you went through that door, you were in a little area that had my mom's closet, my dad's closet. Um, a little bit further, you go into my mom's bedroom. If you went to the right, you would go my, my dad and my mom didn't sleep in the same room at this point, but their bedrooms were, you know, they were back to back. There was a door going from one to the other that was blocked, but it was there, and then there was a bathroom. So this is really, this is really the part of the house that at their age was getting used. So that's why you went in this entrance, because my mom and whoever was caring for her was always in her bedroom which would be just on the other side of the room that has these windows that you see to the right. All right, that, those would be the windows for the room where my dad slept. Right. And then my mom's right on the other side. The kitchen's right there. This is the part of the house they were always in. And, and are you the only one that would pull up in the back like that? No. Is it common for your brothers and your sister to do the same? Oh, we all did it. I mean, we all... We all parked in, in the same way. If you knew you were going to the front of the house or if you knew there was a crowd there or 
for whatever, you, you may park on the driveway, but if you knew under normal circumstances, my dad always stayed in the breakfast room where he had a recliner and a TV. That's where my dad always was. My dad never, you would never go catch him sitting in the den up front or in a, in a living room. He, he, he just wasn't up there. He was in this room watching TV or either he was on this back deck. And my mom was either in her room, which was just off of that, or she might be in the kitchen or, or the breakfast room. And when you got to the house, who was there? Your mother's house on the night of June 7th. My mom was there and Shelly Smith was there. And, and what did you do when you got there? Uh, the first thing I did was I tried to, I tried to, I knocked on the door. The door was locked. I knocked on the door. Shelly didn't hear me. And then what'd you do next? I called. Called what? I called my mom's house to let Shelly know I was there. Please come let me in. Okay. And, and is that the house phone that's been referred to? Yes. Okay. And did she let you in? Sure. And then what happened next? I went in and I visited with my mom. I mean, you want me to go into detail on that? Well, just briefly. Yeah. What'd you do? I, I went in the house. In my mom's bedroom, my mom had a bed that was where she slept in normal times. It, it was like, a, you know, a bed with, um, you know, the poles coming out of the corner, a poster bed that um, coming out of the corners. And she had a bed like that, that where she slept, but she didn't sleep there anymore. But it was in the room. It was a hospital bed. So when you, when you walked in the room, her bed was to the right. Against the wall to the left was a hospital bed, like a single bed, um, but a hospital bed and a TV. And then there was a recliner where whoever was helping her would, would usually sit. So I went in and I sat down on my mom's hospital bed. And I just talked to her for a minute. My mom was awake and I held her hand and- What kind of condition was she in? Uh, she was, I mean, her condition was not good at, at any time, but given her overall condition, she seemed to be doing pretty well. I mean, she wasn't agitated like I thought she would be, or like I was worried she would be, or like Barbara had described her at that point. So she, she wasn't agitated. And, uh, you know, I just talked to her. Any, anytime we talked to my mom, we always tried to be real positive and, um, you know, upbeat and just, and, and I, I just talked to her. You know, I just talked to her, made sure she was okay. Um, did, did you stay seated on the side of her hospital style bed or, or did you move around? I, I mean, I stayed there for a few minutes, uh, you know, I stayed there and I talked to her uh, more than just a few seconds. Right. And then, but, but I didn't stay there. Um, she was, uh, she, she did look tired. Um, so I, I got up and I went and I, I think I sat on my mom's bed for a minute to start with, and then I laid down on my mom's bed, which is, you know, that's what I, I normally did when I went in there. There, there. there wasn't like a lot of chairs to sit in, um, and I just laid back on the bed. Now when talked you talk to Shelly, and we watched TV. Now, when you're talking about your mom's bed, are you referring to her regular bed? That's right. Okay. Not, not her hospital bed, not the bed she was in, but her, her bed, the one I was talking about with, like, posts. Right. Um, the um, let me uh, skip something. Um, was Maggie planning to go over to your mother's with you that night? No, she wasn't planning to go with me that night. Okay. No. Was In fact, Maggie didn't really like to visit my mom. Um, it was, she loved to visit my dad and, and she loved to spend time with my dad. And she spent a lot of time with my mom when my mom was healthy, but 
you know, I mean, by this point, my mom, she was a shell. She was a shell of her old self. And I mean, it was kind of. I mean, it was kind of sad to go and visit her anytime. I mean, she she just she wasn't healthy, and and Maggie didn't like to go and just visit my mom. When when you when you left Moselle to head head to Almeida um, the evening after you'd gone back to the house at Moselle, what say ex that again, Jim? What, what what exit did you use? of the Moselle property when you're going to Almeida on the evening of June 7th? I went out the main gates, which would be straight ahead. The, um, you've heard of the two gates. There's the, there's the shop entrance. Um, there's actually several entrances, but the main ones we used, there was an entrance by the Dove Field. There was an entrance further down by Sawtooth Oaks. But the main ones we used were the shop entrance and what we call the main entrance, where the brick gates were. Did, did you go, why, why didn't you go by the kennels on your way out? There, there wasn't a reason to go by the kennels at that point, and I was going to Almeida, which that the, the main gate would be the, the gates that were closer. Did you notify Maggie uh, in some form that you were leaving to go to uh, See your mom? I tried to call her. And and did she answer? No. And what'd you do after that? I think I tried to call her again. And did she answer? No, she didn't answer. And at some point I texted her after that. Well the fact that she didn't answer on two times, well, did that concern you? At that time? Right. It didn't concern me at all. Number one she was with Paw Paw. So, no, I mean, number two, I mean, it's, it's not unusual to not be able to get somebody all the time when they're at the house or they're it's on the property. I mean, you've heard all the testimony about how spotty cell service was, so no, at the time, it didn't strike me as anything unusual. Okay. Now, moving back to Al Almeida, you spent time with your mother, and then, then you left to head, head back to Moselle. Is that correct? That's correct. And you, you drive, did you drive straight back to Moselle? I did. Now, Alec, there's some um, information from the telemetry data off your suburban and perhaps some of this OnStar G GPS data that indicates that at some point in time in your mother's driveway, you stopped for about a minute. Do you recall seeing that data? I do. What were you doing when you stopped? Do I, you was recall? Getting, I was getting my phone that uh, I, I, my phone had gotten, there was a console in the middle of my car and my phone had gotten down in the console between the console and the seat where you couldn't get to it. Were you, during that minute or however long it was, were you disposing of murder weapons, Alan? No. Were you disposing of bloody clothes? No. And your, your ride back to uh, Moselle, was it, uh, were you driving faster than normal, normal? I was driving however I drive, normal way that I drive. Okay. When you got back to the Moselle property, how did you enter the property? What entrance did you use? Came right back through the main gate. And what did you do then? Went straight to the house. And when you got to the house, what'd you do? I went inside. Were lights on when you pulled up? Or? 
lights were on in the house for sure. I can't remember if there were floodlights on or not. I, I, I don't believe there were any floodlights on, but there were definitely lights. All, all, the, the, all the lights in the house were on, yes. And when you, um, how long did you stay inside the house, roughly? Uh, now that I've seen the benefit of, of these records, I was in there several minutes. Obviously, I mean, were you surprised that Paul and Maggie had not made it back to the house? You know, I don't know if surprised is the right word, but I mean, I, I would have, I, I thought they would have been back by then. Right. You know, but I mean, did it cause me to go into any, it wasn't like I was shocked. But I mean, I thought they would be there. I mean, I, I distinctly remember, uh, uh, you know, I, I went and looked. Sometimes I was very hot natured. Number one, I was hot, I was heavy, and I was taking pills. So I was always hot. Maggie was always cold. Sometimes she would watch TV. We had a TV in the um, hunting room, you, you see on the wall there. Sometimes Maggie would be in there watching TV where she could have the thermostat different than we always kept it cold in the, in the main part of the house. So I know I, 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 know I went in there and, and, and looked in there for her. Uh, it's not unusual for Maggie to be taking a bath and be uh, not able to hear me. So I went back there and, and, and I, I know I did those two things and, and, and looked in those two places. And they weren't there. And so, you know, I, I knew they'd been at the kennels, and I assumed they were still up there. So what'd you do? I went to the kennels. I may have tried to call them. In fact, I probably did try to call them. We, I, I would think I called them. Um, but as I sit here right now, I'm not positive, but I would think I did. would think I tried to call them to see. And now, like, when you, did you drive down to the kennels? In your suburban? I did. What did you see? I saw what y'all have seen pictures of. So bad. <clears throat> Can I have some water? <clears throat> Yeah, I went to um, Did you see them on the ground when you're pulling up in your Suburban? I did. And what'd you do when you came to a stop, Alec? I think I jumped out of my car. I'm not exactly sure what I did, but no, I got out of my car. I know I ran back to my car, called 911. I was on, I called 911. I was on the phone with 911 and I was trying to tend to Paul Paul. I was trying to tend to Maggie. And I just went back and forth between them. Were you um, going to Paul and Maggie while you were on the phone with the um, 911 operators? Yes. Okay. 
Yes. And in a, in a little bit, I'm going to play the 911 tape, but I just want to ask you, and, and you've told law enforcement that's been played here in the court. Um, did you? What did you do when you went up to Paul at some point in time? Hey, Paul. Paul was so, he was so bad. But at some point, I know, I, I mean, I know I tried to check him for a pulse. Um, I know I tried to turn him over. When you say you tried to turn him over, what, why were you trying to turn him over? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I tried to turn him over. Me and my boys laying face down. And he's done the way he's done. His head was the way his head was. I could see his, could see his brain laying on the sidewalk. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I, just, I got, tried to turn him over. I grabbed him by the belt loop. I tried to turn him over. <clears throat> and when I did, his phone popped out. I mean, his phone popped out. And I just picked it up and I put it right back there. Do you have any idea how it popped out? I mean, I know it came out of his pocket when I pulled on his belt loop. When I, when I pulled him to, to turn him over. And it just popped out, and I mean, it popped right beside him. It sat right beside him. Were you were you able to turn Paul at all? I mean, I, I, I didn't. I don't know if I was able to. I didn't turn him over, no. 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 What, what side of the, um, what side of Paul were, were you when you were doing this? I was on um, I was on the side that was away from I was on the side that was away from where my car was. Okay. I mean, I, What'd you do with the phone? I put it back on Paul Paul. <laughs> You know, if you put, you know, which way it was pointing upside down, downside, in any way. I couldn't tell you anything about it. I know his phone popped out. I picked it up and I put it back on him. Did you see any messages on Paul's phone? No. Did you go to Maggie? Did. Did you touch her? I did. Where Where did you touch Maggie? I think I touched her down. Just around like. I don't know. I don't know. If you If you ask me exactly, I I think I touched her down around her waist, but I don't know. It was so bad. Excuse me. I, mean, um, I know I went back and forth. I mean, I went back and forth between them. I know. I know I did. I'd, I'd like to play Doug. Um, uh, the Colleton County portion of the 911 call, the which is in evidence as defendant's exhibit number nine. And, and Doug, this is the long version, the, <coughs> the, the first clip. And stop it when I say stop it, please. 
When you say I've been up to it now and it's bad, what are you referring to? I'm talking about what I saw was what y'all saw pictures of, and I mean it was bad. It was terrible. And and when I first got there, um, I know I got out of the car. Um. And I mean, I know, I, I got out of the car, I mean, I knew. <sighs> got out of the car, but I, right at first, I don't, I don't, I didn't go, I don't think I'm, I went all the way to them. I think I ran back in, in, in and, and that's when I called 911. And so I called 911, and while I was doing that, then is when I went to Maggie and I went to Paul. And so that's what I think I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. Keep going, please. say the word here what are you calling anybody or anything no I'm talking to that dispatcher and, and what did you mean when you said here if you listen to that call one of the first things she asked me one of the first things she asked me was did they shoot themselves and I knew, knew, there's no way. I mean, I knew they didn't shoot themselves. It, just, it, just, it wasn't a gun. They didn't shoot themselves. And she'd asked me that. And then she asked me another question, something about that. And you hear me say here, and then you hear the thing talking. I'm telling her here, and then I say something. And then you hear me say, if that's what you're asking. And I'm letting her know they didn't shoot themselves. I'm saying here, and then I give her an explanation, which you can't hear on that phone, but it's obvious to me what I'm doing. And I say, if that's what you're asking me. 
So, like David Owens asked me on August 11th, did I call a dog or was I talking to somebody? There was no dog that was out and there was nobody there. Well, let's, let's talk about that briefly. Well, when you got there and you saw Maggie and Paul, what, where were the dogs? The dogs were in the kennels. They were, yeah, dogs were in the kennels. They were wherever they were when law enforcement got there. And, and you've seen pictures, and they called Dell Davis to the stand and talk about the hose rolled up. Did, did you roll the hose up? No. Did you do anything down there at the kennels when you got there other than call 911 and attend to Maggie and Paul? Um, no, I, I, I do know that I, I, I was trying to find a flashlight. I was trying to find a gun. Um, other than those things, no, I didn't, do, I didn't do anything at the kennel. I didn't do anything with any hose. I didn't do anything with any dogs. Was there anybody with you? No. All right, keep going, please. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay, and what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay, did you hear anything, or did you come home and find out? I've been gone. I I just came back. Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Allie, we just heard you say, I should have known. What are you referring to? I said, Paul, Paul, I should have known. What were you referring to? I was referring to Paul, Paul got so many threats. <clears throat> Didn't take serious. Think twice about. I'm just telling him, Paul, Paul, I should have known. I don't specifically remember saying that, but I can clearly hear myself say that. Okay. What, what kind of threats did you understand Paul was receiving? I mean, Paul got... He got the most vile threats. I mean, the stuff that was on social media. I mean, it was. I mean, you, you couldn't believe it. You couldn't believe it. It was so over the top. Truthfully, we didn't think anything about it. I mean, it was just so crazy that, you know, we just, I mean, People talking about what he was going to get and how they were going to do this and get him. And I mean, it's, it's stuff you really, I mean, you, you, we, we disregarded it because it's so over the top. Thought it's so over the top. Keep going, please, Doug. <laughs> time you saw them and you said an hour and a half to 
two hours ago and then she followed up two hours ago you just heard that I did hear that um, and I said approximately to her right. question when was the last time you saw them Maggie and Paul right after I took the chicken from Bubba and the, the video we've seen is timestamp 844 uh, p.m. is that correct that's right so was it shortly after 844 it was and it uh, wasn't long after that because you can hear when Bubba gets the chicken and it wasn't long after I took the chicken from him that I left and then you called 911 uh, the records of that but do you remember roughly 907 or right before 907 I mean I've seen the records and seen the um, transcripts yeah and then this is in the records of this but this is some minutes into the conversation with 911 operators correct that's right like uh, knowing everything we know now I mean was it roughly an hour and a half the last time you saw them? it was that would with, with the time of how long it took to get to this point how many minutes that is is 10 10 to 10 how however many you can look exactly and see what point this is and know what time it is but it's between 10 and 10 15 and so I'd seen them around 845 a little bit after okay. all right please keep going Go back to the house and get a gun. I did. And is this the gun that, that you got? And how did you load this gun? What I mean, what did you load it with, if anything? <clears throat> that was gun, as best I can remember. I believe I got that gun off the pool table where you heard there was some other gun. I think that gun was laying with that pool table. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure it was on that pool table. Would have been the first place I came to. I'd know I was grabbing the first gun I could get. I grabbed a handful of shells out of the, um, that I could get my hands on. I know the, I know the gun had a shell in it um, that I loaded, and I, I know I had a few shells, so. Hey, have you seen in this case where there was a 16 gauge shell put in that gun? I've seen in the records and I've seen and heard in the testimony that I put a 16 gauge shell in the gun. Is that a 16 gauge shotgun? It's not a 16 gauge shotgun. It's Why'd a 12 you put gauge. a 16 gauge shell in it? I obviously didn't realize what I was doing. I mean, I know you can't put a 16 gauge shell in a 12 gauge gun and not, I mean, I've been hunting my whole life. I know you can't do that. That's. that's that's not a mistake I would have made. That's not a mistake I'd have made under any circumstances other than that night. Why did you go back to the house to get a gun? I just didn't know. I didn't know. I mean, Saw it, dude. I don't know. I mean, it was just, I, I didn't know if somebody was still out there. I don't know. 
I guess I, I didn't know. Okay. Please keep going. <clears throat> Go back to where he he said he's going to my house to get a gun. Just just a few seconds back, ten seconds maybe. I know you're upset, Mr. Murdoch, but I, I don't want you to get a gun and, and have a gun out whenever my officers get there. Okay? Okay. 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 Nine four two twelve twenty seven. I'm going back to my house just to get a gun just in case. I'm about a hundred yards from my house. <clears throat> Al, you said you're about a hundred yards from the house. That's what I said. Is it much further than that? I mean, as you've heard in the testimony, it's eleven hundred and something feet, but. I said I was 100 yards. You, you, were, you were wrong about your estimate? I'm sure I was wrong. Okay. Keep going. And does anything look out of place? Ma'am, I, I, not, not particularly, really, no, ma'am. Okay. To roll to the um, the next tape of the same call. 22 hours, 13 minutes, 58 seconds. I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't, I don't want you to touch them. 
charts and trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. Not, Alec, that second clip starts at 22, 13, 10, 13, 58, and, and, and you're asked, don't, I mean, you're told don't touch them. H had you touched them by then? Yes. And that way you told the 911 operator? It is. And um, I mean, can, can you say exactly during that six, seven minutes when you actually touched them? I know I touched Maggie. Um, I touched Maggie several times, but I mean, I, I think I didn't. I don't think I touched Papa, but two times. Did you touch? Uh, one or both of them before you got in the car and drove back to the house? Yes. Yeah. One or, or both? Do you know? Both. 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 All right, keep going, please. Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? Happy <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Al, you informed the 911 operator that, that Paul had made reports of these threats. What, what are you referring to? Uh, I mean, I, I just know that it had been reported. I, I don't know that, I mean, I don't believe there was any, like, formal police reports or um, that type of thing. But, I mean, it, it had been reported, and, I mean, it was, it was well known. So were you saying he had filed some official report when you said yes? No, I never thought, I never, I've never thought there was a police report or some formal report like that, no. Do you know whether or not he made some type of report at, on campus? At, oh, I know he did. What, what do you know? I mean, I know that there was a, there was a time when he went to, he was asked to come meet with, um, God, I can't even remember the gentleman's name now, but I appreciated it so much that I never thought I'd forget it, but. Is it part of student counseling service? Yeah, he was the dean of students. Um, right. But anyway, he reached out to Paw Paw and wanted to talk to him. and. Um, I mean, at first we were concerned, you know, why did they, why did they want to talk to him? And I mean, even, I believe I had Paul come talk to you about that because we were concerned, well, what are they going to talk to him about? But when Paul and Jim got there, it turns out that it was really just, I mean, they were wanting to make sure he was okay. But, you know, just it, it, make sure he was okay. And I know that, you know, they were aware of the threats uh, or, or some level of threats. And so, yeah, I mean, it had already been reported to them. Keep going, Doug. Okay, all right. 
Whatever you see, then put your gun up for me, okay? Okay. Okay. How old is your son? 22. Okay. All right. We're, we're getting them out there to you, okay? So, Alec, um, did you call family after you got off the call with, now on the, with the operator? Yes. Who did you call? I know I called my brother Randy. Um, I know I called my brother John. And I know I tried to call Roro. Well, Roro's not family, but I called Randy and John. And I, yeah, I and called then, Randy and John. And then you, you just mentioned Roto? You mean? Ro, 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 Rogan. We called him Ro, I called him Ro, Ro. Why did you try to call Rogan? Um, I mean, Rogan, Rogan's house was like, I don't know, as the crow flies, maybe two and a half miles, three miles. Um, I mean, Rogan was like family. Did you think he was the closest person? Yeah, I just wanted somebody. I wanted somebody to be out there. Had you seen Rogan's name on Paul's phone in any any way that night? No. You called. Um, did Rogan answer? No. Did you try? Trying multiple times. Uh, at looking at these records, I believe that I did, but I believe some of those are um, like the FaceTime calls that are to Rogan. I mean, I'm trying to call him, but I don't believe that was me actually. I, mean, I, I didn't FaceTime. I mean, I didn't FaceTime people. So that, I, I think that's either me trying to call him and hitting FaceTime, or that's me hitting. Um, buttons or hitting the phone in the um, state's exhibit 519 which is the condensed timeline done by uh, agent R rudofsky there's an indication alec that at 10 09 you opened a group text message from michael gunn stating she brought the heat for miami boys were you reading text messages from Michael Gunn right after you got off with the 911 operator? I heard them ask that question. I can promise you I wasn't reading any text messages. There's also an entry, Alec, that says at 10.40 p.m. that you did a Google search or a Safari browser search for Whaley's at Edisto while your wife and son are laying dead on the ground. Did you do that? No. Whaley's is a restaurant at Edisto that we ate at a lot of times. We got takeout from a lot of times. So I'm assuming it was in my search history, pulling up the restaurant. And I obviously was trying to call people or dialing and I, I hit that. I wasn't doing any Google searches. And as one of the persons that you dialed that night, a, a wedding photographer? Uh, it's a guy named Brian White. I saw that on the call log. Brian White's a guy who was in my, um, what do you call it, um, contacts that is a, um, a, a videographer that I've used in cases. I haven't used him in two years. And he's a good guy, but we're not personal friends, so I certainly wasn't calling him. So were you, what, what does that indicate to you that those actions on your phone, what, how do you account for that? Well, they were, obviously they're unintentional. I mean, I'm doing something with my phone trying to call people, but I'm not trying to call those people. I'm not doing a Google search for any Whaley's restaurant, and I'm certainly not reading any text. I want to ask you, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have you go to the jury room for a break of about 10 minutes. Please do not discuss the case. You'll stay put, Mr. Murray.
take a 10 minute recess and they step down and not discuss your testimony.
All rise and come to order. We bring the jury. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Alec, you've, you've talked about going to Paul's body and, and Maggie's body. Do you recall getting blood on, on you, on your hands, or any part of you? Yes. Okay. Do, do you know with whose blood you would have gotten on you? I know I got blood on my fingertips. Um, Can you differentiate, you know, whether it was Maggie or Paul? It's probably both. Um, Except for so much below. But <laughs> there, um, turns out there was a drop of blood on the steering wheel, the Suburban. Do you know how that got there? Um, I mean, if it was fresh, I put it there. If it was not fresh, I mean, Maggie drove my car all the time, but I, I assume it got there from me touching Maggie and then, and then touching the steering wheel that night. And then I think maybe there's possibly blood on this gun. Maybe not. I mean, did, do you know if you got transferred blood on anything else that if, night? If Maggie's blood's on that gun, then I I put it there. I mean Maggie. I mean Maggie didn't really fool with guns other than to put them up. There's um. Did you submit to a, a GSR examination that night? Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier, um, and that Brian Barnado testified about. Where, where your hands were swapped? That's right. And then your clothes were collected by, I don't know if it's Agent Owen or someone else. That's, that's correct. And um, and turns out there's some GSR on your shirt and on your shorts. And um, did, did you handle this gun? This, this is? Uh, yes. This is item 22 that... Yes, I, had the, I basically had that gun with me until I put it up against my car. Um, when, when the um, police officer, I think it was Mr. Green, got there, I put it against my car. We're, and, and I think Nolan had testified that this is you know, one of the shotguns Paul liked to use. It is. Was he metic meticulous about cleaning his guns? Papa? Yeah. 
No. Now, when he cleaned it, he was meticulous about it, but uh, it was far and few between when he actually cleaned them. Your, um, your chart was went through testing and analysis, and you were part of this case, provided results of that, were you not? Yes, sir. I mean, I wasn't provided at the time. I've seen them. Right. Getting, seen all these records. Do you, um, well, just let me ask you, did, did you get on your shirt high velocity blood spatter from being within a distance of a shooting, Maggie or Paul? There's no way that I had high velocity blood spatter on me. Had you seen reports that said that at one point in time? I have seen reports that said that. Just to be clear, were you anywhere in the vicinity when Paul and Maggie were shot? I was nowhere near Paul and Maggie when they got shot. After Sled collected uh, your clothing that night uh, at the main residence at Moselle, did I mean, you remember changing in? You remember what you changed into? Do I remember? Yeah, yeah. I know I changed clothes, and I, I've, I've learned since then what I had on, but I don't. You don't remember? Okay. I don't remember that at all. But I understand I had on athletic shorts and a t-shirt. Sure. Um, and other people have talked about this. I'm not going to repeat it. But did, um, where did you spend the night or where did you go to after leaving Moselle um, when, when you left for the evening? Or? We went to Alameda too. We went to my mom and dad's house and we stayed there. And who went with you? Um, I believe that Bus in Brooklyn and I rode together. John Marvin might have been with us. I know John Marvin stayed at Almeida with us. I just don't know if he rode in the same car we rode in. But I know I rode with Buster in Brooklyn. I know that for a fact. And the, the next morning, um, what'd you do? And I, I, we're talking about daylight hours on June the 8th. What, what did you do? And we basically got up and came back to Moselle. Do you remember roughly what time you got to Moselle? I don't remember. No, I don't remember what time. I re and, and you know, there's things I remember about that morning, but I don't remember exactly what time we left. And, and Alec, we'll get to this in more detail, but during that period of time, is it, is it hard to remember? times, what time things started and stopped and how long things took? I mean, it's definitely hard to remember. Now, looking at these timelines and all these records, I mean, it, it sure helps, but to, to, to just do it off the top of my head is, is very difficult. Okay, and we'll, we'll get to more of that. Um, when you went back to Moselle um, on the morning of June the 8th, did you, um, do you know whether you took a shower there or took a shower at Almeida or took a shower at all? No, I know we took a shower at Moselle. I did not take a shower before I left Almeida. I, we basically got up and went to um, Moselle. Maggie's mom and dad. They were there? Well, they were coming. I had to tell them, to see them. We got up, I mean, we got up from Almeida and we left and we went to Moselle. And you, and do, do you know, do you even recall Sled coming in and searching the house for anything on the 8th? I knew that, um, I mean, I knew they were doing it, yeah. Um, 
I knew they would. I, I knew they were doing it. But I, I don't remember, I wasn't out in that gun room and I'll see all that video and all that, but I knew SLED yeah, was coming in there. I mean, we made, I mean, we, we, we made the house available for them to come in there. So, I mean, I can't tell you details, but yeah, I remember it. Did, did you at one point just tell SLED they had carte blanche to search anywhere, any time? I told SLED they could do anything, anywhere, anytime that they wanted to, anything to do with me, my property, my cars, even though I didn't own the cars, I would get my law firm on the cars, I would have the people, they had full, whatever they wanted, they were welcome to. And uh, did you have any discussions with David Owen or anybody that's led about Consenting to General Motors to get that off the car. Every time that I talked to David Owens, I would ask him about getting OnStar data and GPS data from phones. And why was it important to you to get OnStar data and GPS data from the phone? To confirm where I was saying I went, what I did, GPS. You know, at that point in time, I knew that Maggie's phone um, had been taken, and I knew that my Suburban and my phone and Maggie's phone never crossed paths, and that was extremely important to me, and I asked him about it every single time we talked, every single time. And um, speaking of Maggie's phone, do you did you know her password to her phone? Yes, I knew her password. Did you know her password to her computer? Yes. Did she know your password? Yes. Okay. And when Maggie's phone was located um, on the side of the road, did, did you provide SLED the password to her phone? I did. I think I actually provided it to John Marvin, who provided it to SLED, but I'm the one who gave it to him. Right. <laughs> and your knowledge that um, Maggie's have these location services on her phone, she used them frequently? All the time. One of Maggie's things that she liked to do was th there's an app called Find My Friends that you can see what other people are doing and they can see what you're doing. Maggie loved me, Bus, Papa, Brooklyn, um, Grandma, Papa T, Marion, uh, the three girls, uh, Lizzie. And there were a few others, but the people that were closest to her, she had them all in her phone, and she loved to, to, to look at that phone and see where people are, and she'd love to surprise you. Like, let's say you're at um, Walmart, she looks on there, and, and she'd love to text you, get me a TV from Walmart or something, you know, like, she, she follow you and see where you were. She used it all the time. And so, you know, I just knew that there would be GPS data on Maggie's phone. Alec, when you're being interviewed on the night of June 7th <coughs> and again on June the 10th, what was your understanding as to why they, they were interviewing you? Why were you being interviewed? On By June the 7th and June the 10th? Yes, sir. What's the question again? What is his understanding of why SLED was interviewing him on the night of June the 7th and again on June the 10th? And the basis for the abduction? 401 and 402, Your Honor. What do you mean? Uh, relevance, Your Honor. His understanding is, is not important. What he said is important, Your Honor. Response. Well, I, I can. It goes to his. 
you know, has followed, it, it, it goes to his state of mind. I mean, that, that's what it goes to. Objection sustained. Did, um, why, was it, why was it important to you to be able to get data from the Suburban, data from your phone, and, and data from Maggie's phone? I knew at that point in time, I knew since I was the person who found Paul Paul and Mags that I was a suspect. I mean, they kept talking about this circle, um, but uh, I mean, I, I knew that it was very important for me to find that, to get that. And, and what was your belief as to that information? What would it have done for you? There's no question in there that it would demonstrate that I couldn't have done this. And when was the data from General Motors off that Suburban finally obtained? It was either this past Saturday or the Saturday before that, according to what uh, was said in this courtroom. During this trial? Absolutely. And uh, to your knowledge, was GPS data ever able to be located off Maggie's phone? No, no, I mean, not just to my knowledge, it was not able to be gotten. And, you know, the testimony was in here that, that, it, that, it couldn't, that it couldn't be gotten. It only went back to um, June the 9th. Everything before that was erased on Maggie's phone. Now, when um, starting June the 8th, when that Moselle, you had, did a lot of people come to support you, be with you on June the 8th? On June the 8th? Yes. Like sir. the next day? Right. Yes, sir. A lot of people. And, and you mentioned your Maggie's parents and, and family came as well? Yes, sir. Um, from from that moment, June eighth, when folks, family um, came and to uh, Moselle, and, and you met with them, were were you left alone by any of your family members the rest of that week? No, I mean, I, I was attached to Buster. At the hill. But, I mean. And what no, happened on I wasn't. And and what, I, hap what happened on June the 10th? Besides being interviewed by Sled? My dad died. My dad passed. Where did you stay and with whom did you stay on the night of June the 8th, the night of June the 9th, the night of June the 10th? On the night of June, you asked me to start on the 8th? The 8th, yes, sir. All right, starting on the 8th, I stayed with Buster every night. I stayed with Buster, and as long as Brooklyn was there, I stayed with Buster in Brooklyn. Um, but we stayed with, we, we, I'm pretty sure that's beginning on the 8th. I know the 7th we stayed at Almeida, and I believe on the 8th we started staying at John Marvin and Lizzie's at Greenfield. And how far, is, how far is Greenfield from Almeida? As the crow flies, I mean, it's no distance. It's less than five minutes. It's probably a couple of, few minutes away. And, and who stayed there? Did, did John Marvin and, and his wife Liz stay there as well? Yes, John and Lizzie. Um, all right, John and Lizzie stayed there and their kids, Bus and Brooklyn and I. Um, I know Bubba and May May stayed there. Well, Lizzie's mom and daddy stayed there. Um, And 
my daddy's best friend and his wife came in there. I believe they came before my daddy passed. I know they came after he passed and stayed there. And that, <clears throat> how many nights do you recall staying there at um, Greenfield? So I stayed at Greenfield. Right, the seventh was a Monday. I stayed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Greenfield. I know that for a fact. And the Maggie and Paul's funeral was Saturday. Is that right? No, I heard that in this courtroom say it was Saturday, but so the memorial services. No, nah, their funeral was on Friday. Oh, it was on Friday. I know that for a fact too. And then your father's funeral was on Sunday. My father's funeral was on Sunday, and it was my it was my father's funeral. I forget the term. But Sunday. I mean, that's when that's when we put up off the mags. That's when we buried him. We didn't bury him when we had the service on Friday. Because I don't think they were done. But that's when we buried them, along with my dad, on Sunday. And Alec, what did you do with the following week, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Um, starting when now? <clears throat> so the Monday. day after your dad's funeral. All right, Monday. Um, I went to I went to um, Grandma and Papa T's, Somerville. At some point, Monday. In the afternoon. You mean what? What did I do when I got up that yeah, morning? Well, yeah, we just yeah. Where Where did you stay? We Monday stayed night? at We stayed at Greenfield Sunday night. So we woke up at Greenfield on Monday. And so. And, and Sunday night you were with the same family members, your brother and Brooklyn and Buster and That's right. Okay. And Liz. And Lizzie and Lizzie's mom and dad. And I believe Donnie and Paula were still there, but I can't remember when they left. And then you went to uh Somerville with whom? Um, I believe I went to Somerville by myself, but um, I know Buster in, in, in the car by myself. I can't remember if Buster and I rode together, but I think we might have had separate cars. We, we probably we probably did ride together that first day. I don't remember, but I know I went to Somerville, and Buster was in Somerville with me, okay. with Grandma and Papa T. And, and Somerville is where Maggie's parents live? That's right. That's, um, that's Maggie's mom and dad. His grand, Maggie's mom's grandma and Maggie's dad's Papa T. And did you stay with them for a few days in Somerville? I stayed with them longer. In Somerville, yeah, I stayed with them. Um, we stayed in Somerville Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and then we went to Greenville. Okay. Um. And and what was in Greenville? Um, my niece. That was um. Was, she was having a baby, and Maggie had just been. She's just been so excited. So, she's just so proud of those girls. She was so excited about the baby. And so, the baby being born just became such a, such a big deal to me. So was the baby born? Yeah. Okay. And you went yep, out? Baby was, Born, beautiful little baby girl, beautiful little mom. Okay. 
And then did you go up, up to the lake after that? We did. Well, I mean, we stayed this lake um, Kiwi that y'all heard about is really close to Greenville. And so when I say we went to Greenville, we really went to Lake Kiwi. But we went up there because, you know, and, and, and um, when, when she had the baby, I, I, I want to say the baby might have gotten born shortly after we got there, like Thursday, but it, I think it was Saturday before we could go and see them and, and, and see my niece and see the baby. So, you know, I mean, that's where we went was to Lake Kiwi. All right. But they live in Greenville. On the morning of June 16th, I think that was that Wednesday, I think that's a Wednesday, um, where'd you wake up? Somerville. Did you ever go to Almeda on that day? On Wednesday? Yes, sir. I don't, I don't believe so. Did you go to Almeda at 6.30 in the morning on the... I, I know for a fact that I didn't go to Almeda at 6.30 in the morning. I was in Somerville. Did I didn't go to Almeda at any point early in the morning. I was in Somerville. And I'm not positive about this, but I know those, I know, I know they did a, a some, I know some of those records they have, it was some time before I left Somerville. Okay. Did you, um, did you ever take a, during that week, let's just start with that, that, that week following your dad's funeral, did you ever take a tarp into the house at Almeda? A tarp, a blue tarp. The week following my dad's funeral? Yes, sir. No, I did not. There's been, um, I don't know where it is in any of the boxes, but this, this blue rain jacket. Have you ever seen that before? Never seen it before, never touched it, and don't know anything about it. Okay. Did you, um, do you ever remember taking a tarp at any point in time over the house that I mean? No, I don't remember it. I don't remember taking a tarp over there, but you know, I mean, Shelly's got something in her mind about that, and there may have been some point but I certainly don't remember it. And it certainly wasn't any time around my dad's funeral or the weeks following. I think we, we, we talked br briefly about um, about your recollection of times and, okay. and, and and I just want to play um, Doug from State's Exhibit 517 which is the August 11th interview starting at 5 minutes and 52 seconds if you could pull that clip up and and I want you to listen to this Alan. okay tell, tell me again what it is it's August 11th interview, starting okay. at 5 minutes and 52 seconds. All right. Can you go to 5 minutes and 52 seconds? Who was at your house when you left, and what time did you go to the office? Uh, uh, we had been to a ball game that weekend. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what time. It would have been 
uh, somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30 probably, okay. 10 o'clock maybe at the latest, okay. something like that. Al, you, on this tape, were you being asked when you went to work on the on the seventh? Yes. And you said eight thirty to nine thirty in the morning. And then I think it said ten o'clock at the latest. Is that correct? No, it wasn't. Now I've seen all these records. What does it look like? What time you went to work on the on the seventh? A little afternoon. All right. Um, if we'll go to the uh, Doug State's Exhibit 243, which is the June 10 interview. You know, Mr. Griffin, on that same date, though, I also, if you play that thing, I don't, and I don't know if it's right then, but if you play that further, I also told him the best way to see exactly when I went in that door is to go and get my information from my law firm. And I told them that, they, you know, we have a, you know how things are electronic now where you don't have a key, you have a key card. And, um, and you have a key card in your wallet. And so when you use it, it creates a, like all this other stuff, a digital footprint. And I told David Owens that he could go get it from my office. And, and, and was that a common response of yours when you were asking about specific times that you would give them you know, your best estimate, but you would point them to where they could find the most accurate data? Yes, sir. You did that more than once? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, if we've got the June 10th interview, which is State's Exhibit 243, and, and Doug, I'd like to go to 9 minutes and 59 seconds. And here the, 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 you're being asked, when did Paul arrive at Moselle? Roughly what time in the afternoon? You know, I would think it'd be somewhere in the five o'clock range. A little bit. It was. It was broad daylight when we were. It wasn't dusk, dark, or late. Okay. You know, and we rode. Uh, you know, we just rode around. We rode around. So, did you tell him on on June tenth that Paul got there at five o'clock time period? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I obviously did. And was that incorrect? <laughs> yes, sir. It was incorrect. Okay. And what what time did you? Looking at the records now, what time did it look like Paul actually got there? And looking at the records, it's clear that he got there sometime around 7 o'clock. Did at some point in time you have a conversation with Shelly Smith about, you know, how long you were over uh, at Almeda on the night of June the 7th? Do you remember? You know, I don't distinctly remember having a conversation with her about how long I was over there, but... I know that I told Shelly Smith that um, SLED was going to come and talk to her and that I'd appreciate it if she would talk to them and that she just needed to tell them the truth. And um, did you take extra care not to talk to people that you knew SLED would be talking to? Absolutely. And why is that? After this boat wreck, that you've heard so much talk about in this courtroom. There were social media, newspaper. Um, I mean, it went deeper than that, but I mean, there were so many, so much talk about how I, you know, fixed witnesses and, 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 and structured the investigation, just things that were totally false, that were absolutely baseless, but it was said repeatedly, repeatedly, and it was reported repeatedly how I'd done this and would this witness and influence this police officer and all these things. So I wasn't taking any chances. I want to um, ask you about you can take that down, Doug. Thank you. Ask you about the August, August, August 11th interview um, with uh, David Owen at the sled office in, I think, here in Walterboro. Do you remember that? Wait, the, my, August, August 11th, absolutely. Um, had, had you requested a, that meeting? I've been requesting 
What I'd really been requesting is some information. I've been begging David Owens to come meet with me and specifically I wanted Grandma, Papa T. There were so many questions that I couldn't answer. And I've been begging him to meet with me and to meet with Grandma and Papa T. I've been begging him for weeks and weeks. And did um, you went into the meeting on August 11th, did you think that's what it was for, to give you an update? Yes. Okay. And um, at the conclusion of the meeting, they let you know that, that you're their prime suspect. Mr. Griffin. I, I'll, I'll rephrase it. At the, at, by the conclusion of the meeting, had, did they make it known to you that, that you were suspect? Oh, there's no question about that. Absolutely. Now, he used a lot of, I mean, you hear it talk about how I'm in this circle and he can't get me out and this and that, but there's no doubt in my mind. There was no question in my mind what was going on. And the um, and during that meeting, did they show you uh, the Snapchat Snapchat video of you uh, trying to stand up the fruit tree? Yes. And were you questioned about what clothing you were wearing? And I can't remember this. I can't remember if he showed me the whole video or he showed me a picture of it. Um, but I was definitely showed that information. I was definitely shown those clothes in that meeting on August the 11th. And, and what clothes were you wearing? The same ones you see in. And, and do, you, do you remember what kind of pants? It, it was khaki pants. And what kind of shirt? It's a, a button down, short sleeve button down. I call it a dress shirt, but short sleeve button down dress shirt. Like, like shirt you got there, but just short Just sleeve. like this, but short sleeve, and it was colored. And it was what color was it? Blue. Blue with some blue stripes. And were you questioned about when you changed out of those clothes? I was. And um, did you have a follow-up? Did you have a conversation after that meeting with Sled with Blanca about what you were wearing that day? Absolutely. And what was the purpose of the conversation with Blanca? Well, they had made an issue about that in that meeting and I asked Blanca about those clothes that that I had on earlier that day. Did you ask her specifically about the blue shirt? I asked her specifically about all the clothes. Okay. I, what I asked Blanca about specifically was did she remember getting my clothes after she came back um, when, she, when she came back to Moselle, did she remember getting my clothes? It's specifically what I asked her. I see. And, and why were you asking her those questions? Because on August the 11th, they had made an issue about me wearing, still wearing those clothes, not having changed clothes when I was in that Snapchat video. So that's why I went to Blanca. Did they ever ask you on August the 11th whether... Um, I mean, they ask you for those clothes. Can you produce the clothes? Did they ask you that? No, they didn't. Have they ever asked you for those clothes? No. As far as my understanding goes, my clothes were never an issue in this case until y'all figured out, as my lawyers figured out, that there was no blood spatter on me. Sir? Is that objection, Your Honor? Four hundred one, four hundred two, and beyond uh, in speculation, Your Honor. Mr. Griffin, it's a matter of public record. 
it's a matter of public record. What is? Uh, the issues with the shirt and the blood test. It's a matter of public record. It's filed in this case, yes, sir. The objections overruled. I'm well aware that my clothes never became an issue in this case until my lawyers proved that this blood spatter that they said I had on my shirt for my wife and my son was a lie and that there was no blood on my shirt. And once they filed the documents and they proved that that was a lie, all of a sudden, the clothes I was wearing back on that day became an issue. And that's in the weeks leading up to this trial. Now, Alec, after the Maggie and Paul were murdered on June 7th and 8th, where did you stay and where did you keep clothes? All right. Say that again, please. Where were you staying overnight? Well, let me ask you this. Did you ever spend another night at Moselle after June 7th? I never spent another night at Moselle. Why not? Could have. Didn't want to. Okay. Where were you staying? Well, we talked about the, the days and weeks, the week afterwards, but where were you staying when you got back from the Lake Kiwi and um, Greenville? I stayed. All right, so when I got back from Greenville, so yes. that would be the. All right, be, um, so the first week, I've been doing my dad's funeral, then, all right, so that'd be the second week. All right, so after we, I know Bus and I, um, I stayed with Grandma and Papa T as much as I could, um, you know. Um, I stayed with, um, I, st I stayed with my brother Randy a lot. Um, I stayed with my brother John a lot. Um, Bus and I stayed at Edisto a little bit. But at the beginning, I stayed with, I really stayed with either my brother Randy and his wife Christy, or I stayed with my brother um, John and his wife Lizzie. And basically, at that time, Buster was doing, excuse me, Buster was, Buster was, Buster worked for Wild Wing at that time, and they had been so kind to him and gave him, he was, they let him be off just for just a ridiculous amount of time. They were so good to him. So he stayed with me. When he had to go back to work, he would stay at my brother John and Lizzie's because it was close. So... I would stay with Randy and Christy um, in Hampton. When Buster was there, I would almost always go to um, John and Lizzie's when Buster was there. I would go to John and Lizzie's sometimes when um, Buster wasn't there. But I, I was Johnny Parker, one of my partners, had a guest house. His uh, mother-in-law had lived in when she was sick that's really it, it's right at the foot of Randy's drive it's a hundred yards 70 yards from Randy's house and I was going to move into I was going to move into that house until we figured out where I could live so I had clothes there I had clothes at Randy's I had clothes at John Marvin's. I had clothes at Chichesi, which is, I think you heard Buster talk about Chichesi's, like where we went to the, to the river. 
and I had closed there. Um, I had closed in Somerville. And I still had closed at Moselle. So you're closed. Yes, sir. Last question. No, this. Uh, so you were your clothes spread out, a lot of different places. Yes. All right. Thank you. We'll break for lunch and return at in an hour and fifteen minutes. Please do not discuss the case. Recess, let's see, it's 125, what's that? 240? Recess to the 240.
You may bring the jury. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Mr. Murdoch, I, I want to um, go to June the 7th, 2021, and you're meeting with Gene Seconder. Uh, okay. Do you remember meeting Ms. Seconder? I do. And, and what was the meeting about? Uh, Jeannie came up to me and uh, asked me, previously Annette Griswold had come to me and asked me about uh, the fee check in the Ferris case. And Jeannie was coming to me and saying that she was following up on that. If she didn't, she wouldn't be doing her job and, and asked me some questions. Well, let me ask you. Which I understood. Briefly, um, the Ferris fee, what, what originally happened to it? The PMPED portion of the Ferris fee. You mean the, originally? Yes, sir. Did it come to you directly? Yes. Should have come to you directly? No. Okay. Did, um, when, when Ms. Seconder asked you about the where the fee was, what'd you tell her? I can't remember exactly what I told her. The, the, the conversation got interrupted very quickly, but I told Jeannie that the funds were in Chris Wilson's account and, and nothing to worry about. I, wasn't, I didn't know where the mix-up came from. What, what was your level of concern about Ms. Seconder's inquiry to you on June the 7th? There was some level of concern because she's asking me about money that I took that I wasn't supposed to have. So certainly I had some level of concern, but it, 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 wasn't, it, it wasn't a very big concern. Um, as you heard testimony earlier, at some point Annette Griswold had sent Chris Wilson an email, something to the effect of, Ellick thinks he has more expenses or, or something like that, seeking financial documents from Chris Wilson. When Chris Wilson got, I wasn't copied on that, but when Chris Wilson got that, Chris Wilson called me up and he's like, you know, w w what is this all about? Uh, <clears throat> Pardon? I said objection rules 801 and 802. Response. Your Honor, I'll, I'm not asking for what Chris Wilson said, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on. All right. I, I accept the objection. Um, were, you, were you concerned about Chris Wilson opening his trust account records to um, your law firm? No, I was not concerned about that at all. And, I, and why were you not concerned? I knew that one of the people that Chris Wilson, uh, as you heard, Chris Wilson and I were very close. We talked every day. I, I, I did work with him all the time. And 
I mean, he was one of the people closest to me in the whole world. I, 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 I knew everything about him. And I, I knew he was going through one of his partners, and he and his partner had split up. A partner and an associate had moved to a firm in Charleston. The partner was going through a divorce. And the wife of the partner was trying to get Chris Wilson's trust documents in that case to find out money her husband got. It didn't have anything to do with Chris and I or anything. It, it totally had to do with that. But I knew that Chris Wilson was not going to send any financial documents to my law firm at least at that time and at least not any time soon. So while I'm sure it registered with me that I got to deal with this, at that particular time, it wasn't anything that was a big deal. Was there an immediate urgency to the situation on June the 7th? No. Um, and I believe uh, there's Ms. Seconder testified about your conversation with her. You learned that your dad um, was going back in the hospital. That's correct. Uh, there was a text. I can't remember if that text came from my brother Randy or my brother John, but they were the ones that were taking my dad back to the hospital that day. And whichever one was with him, I believe it was John was with him at the hospital, but I know Randy was with him at some treatments. It's in those documents. But bottom line is, we got a text saying, we knew my dad was really sick. He had cancer and he couldn't breathe. And there was a big issue about whether his inability to breathe was coming from an obstruction caused by the cancer, which was the worst case scenario, and that's what it ended up being ultimately, and that's what he died from. But this particular text was saying, okay, we're putting him back in the hospital, the doctor thinks it's pneumonia, and, which was, you know, I mean, pneumonia is never a good thing, but when compared to cancer, at that time, pneumonia, that was a good thing to learn that. So on the seventh, where the information you had, did, I mean, were you believe at that time that, you, that the prognosis was pretty positive for your father? Well, it was better than the alternative. I, I'm not gonna say it was good, but it was better than, it was better than the alternative and, and, and what we had previously thought it was. It didn't stay good very long, but it did, definitely was better. Do you uh, know whether or not you you told Ms. Seconder that um, that your dad's condition was terminal on the seventh. Do you know? Do you remember whether you said that or not? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't have said that at that time. Um, and, and, and what I, you know, Jeannie, as soon as the thing comes through that my dad's going in the hospital, Jeannie and I, as you heard, I mean, she stopped the meeting. We stopped it. It, it, it lasted a couple minutes. Now, my dad's going in the hospital. And the very next day, we learned that he's terminal. And I'm, I'm just sure that a year or, or, or the amount of time that's gone by, Jeannie assumed she was terminal. He was terminal. Speculation, Your Honor. Section's overruled. Uh, Mr. Murdoch, the, uh, On June the 7th, did you believe that your financial house of cards was about to crumble? On June the 7th? Yes, sir. Absolutely not. Um, had, had you had, and I think there's documented evidence, state introduced, had, had you had reached out to Russell Lafitte at Palmetto State Bank about extending a line of credit on the Moselle property? Yeah, I had reached out to him. I, I can't remember the date of that text, but it was... Fairly recently, I, I had reached out to Russell. And on June 7th, did, did you have equity in the Moselle property that, or you and, or you and Maggie had equity in that Moselle property? Sure, and I mean, Moselle was fully in Maggie's name. Okay. Um, so, but yes, there was equity in Moselle, in looking at the documents that had been used, there was a million eight hundred thousand dollars 
owed, there was an appraisal for 3.3 million without timber value. And so on 1,700 acres, you know, I don't know what the timber value was, but if you just said $1,000 an acre, that'd be another million something dollars in value over and above the appraisal. I, I doubt the timber value was that high. I'm just using that as an example. But if it was 500, it'd be another $800,000. So, you know, there was several million dollars in equity in that Moselle property. All right, and did, uh, did you have equity in the Edisto Beach House? Yes. And on, around June 7, how much equity did you have in the Edisto Beach House? If I remember the records correctly, there was about $250,000 um, owed on that house and whatever the value was at the time. I, I, think, I, I think there's a contract for just under a million dollars, so 700 and something thousand dollars. Did um, Maggie's death make it more difficult to obtain financing immediately after the murder around June 7th, 8th? Maggie's, yes. How so? Because the entire Moselle property was 100% in Maggie's name. The Edisto property was 50% in Maggie's name. So I was only a half owner. So with Maggie, all I had to do is get her to sign the documents, which she always did. I mean, she didn't question finances. So, I mean, she signed the papers. When Maggie wasn't here, there was estate the issues. I, I, could, I couldn't go and sign the papers like I would normally go and get a loan. So I, I, I couldn't. Okay. On, um, was there a hearing scheduled in the boating lawsuit where you were a defendant set for that week? Yes. Do you remember what day it was scheduled for? Well, I mean, I've heard the testimony, and I knew, I'm sure I knew at the time, it's June the 10th, Thursday, June the 10th. Right. Um, were, what was your uh, level of concern about that hearing coming up on June the 10th? About that hearing? Yes, sir. Um, my level of concern about that hearing was about the venue motion that was coming up, which... Um, now, what do you mean by venue? A venue motion is, venue is where a civil lawsuit is pending. And so there's laws and, and, and rules that govern where you can bring a case. There's laws and rules that govern how certain parties, a defendant or a plaintiff, can go about trying to move it from one place to another. So in this case, the plaintiffs, the Beach family, had filed suit in Hampton County. Parkers was trying to move venue to Beaufort County. And I wanted the case to stay in Hampton County. Um, and, and Really, that was my only thought about, I wasn't doing the legal work on those. I, I was a party in that case. I, I wasn't. I mean, Danny Henderson was primarily representing me personally. John Tiller uh, and Amy Bauer were representing me personally. And Dawes Cook was representing me personally. And those are the guys that were doing the legal work. So, you know, um, I, I wasn't actually doing that work, but what I was concerned about was the venue motion. I had already done what I had to do for the financial motion, and, and Danny Henderson was on me about getting him a financial statement because... Well, let, let's stop. So okay. There was a motion 
to compel and seek a lot of financial records from you. Is that correct? Absolutely. And were you concerned that your house, financial house, was going to be opened up for the world as a result of that hearing? No. I've been a plaintiff's lawyer like Mr. Tinsley that sat here. We do the same exact thing. In my law firm, the, the guys in my law firm are some of the best lawyers that I've ever known. And they're definitely some of the best lawyers in the state, handling some of the biggest cases that have ever gone on in this state. In my 27 years of practicing, plaintiffs always are trying to look and get financial documents of corporate defendants, of, you know, those type things. In my 27 years, I've never been able to get a judge to order anything more than a net worth statement prior to getting into a phase at trial. So early on in the case, I am not aware of, I personally have never, despite trying repeatedly, have never been able to get a judge to order the kind of information that Mark Tinsley was saying he was seeking. Were, were you working on a document for that upcoming hearing? Yes. And what was that? A financial statement. Okay. A financial and statement lists your assets and your liabilities. And had you reached out to uh, Jeannie Seconder later that the day on the 7th to get your current balance of your retirement account? You know, I don't remember doing that, but that'd certainly be something that I, I did and because I, I, I know I'd have to have that for that financial statement. And the document that I prepared was what Mark Ball talked about that he found later in my office. And it was tight, it was handwritten, ready to be typed up by, you know, because of the charges against Paul, I was so, I kept everything very close in the civil case. It was Danny in his office um, that was doing it. And I had that document prepared, handwritten in the neatest handwriting that I could make because a secretary other than mine, or a paralegal other than mine, was gonna be the person who was gonna put those, that financial information into the final document. And that's the document that Mark Ball talked about that he found on my desk whenever it was that he found it. Okay. So that was what was going to be, if necessary, what was going to be used Thursday. Well, the jury's heard uh, about uh, testimony of you stealing client funds. Did you do that? I did. Did you steal um, or divert that Ferris fee away from the law firm? I did. Um, how did you get in such a financial predicament that led you to steal money that wasn't yours? You know, I'm not quite sure how I let myself get where I got, but it came from, you know, I battled that addiction for so many years. I was spending so much money on pills. I got in a spot I couldn't. Now what type yeah. of addiction are you referring to? My, my addiction is, yeah. to, is to opiate painkillers. And, and when Specifically, did you, oxycodone, oxycontin. And when did you first become dependent or addicted to opioids? Oxycodone or opiates in general? Opiates in general. I'm not quite sure of the exact date, but I can give you a time frame. I, I hurt my knee really bad playing football in college, and I had a knee surgery. And... The, the, the medical science at the time was such that the, the, the surgery didn't work, bottom line. So uh, it, it, it just didn't last. So within a couple of years of that, I started having a lot of knee troubles. And ultimately, I, I had to have a, 
a, a couple of surgeries, but um, the, 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 the last surgery I had was, I think, around 2002 or four, And I, I think it was around four, so I would have started taking hydrocodone a couple of years before that. And I took hydrocodone, got addicted to that very quickly. Um, I continued taking that for a long time. I would I'd, I'd, I'd force myself off of it, wean myself off of it. I'd go back to it. Um, I, I, I battled that for a long time. And after a while, I was taking so much of that, I moved on to oxycodone. And, um, you know, I'm guessing that was around 2000, that, that, that transition was around 2008, 9, something like that. Um, and of course, you know, it, it, it just, it just escalates, and escalates, and escalates. And it's Did you um, receive treatment or go to detox on occasion? I did. How many times? Um, that I went to detox or that I detoxed? Well, let's start with going to a detox facility. Um, I've been to a detox facility three times. When was the first time? Um, December of 2017. Okay. And, um, before December 2017, had, had you tried to detox at home? <laughs> I tried to detox every way I could. Right. When Maggie you, would help me. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, when, when you um, when you went in to a was it inpatient facility? The detoxes, the, the formal detoxes that yeah, I went in, to? in December 2017. Yes, it was in, in, it was inpatient. And all three formal detoxes that I've done have been at the same facility called Sunrise Detox in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's a very good is, facility. Jury's heard an audio tape of a telephone conference with SLED agents. Was that where you were during that meeting with Mr. Harputley and I? That's correct. Um, the, the first time you went to the detox in Atlanta, uh, how, how long of a stay is that? Did you stay? Seven days is, is the um, opiate detox program. And, and is there a difference between detox and rehab? Yes. What's the difference? Uh, detox is the... Uh, it's the act of getting the drugs out of your system, getting to the point where, okay, there is no longer a physical dependency, all right? And that's a big difference than the rest of the dependency, but the physical dependency is supposed to be gone after seven days. So, in other words, the, um, I mean, there are so many things opiate withdrawal is I mean it's it's hard um, but supposedly at the end of seven days you don't have those physical symptoms like I don't want to be too graphic but you're you know you're sick you throw up you um you have terrible diarrhea you sweat like you're running a marathon. Um, you can't hold your legs still. You, 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 you can't lay down. Now, like what I'm talking about, the, the legs moving, that goes away after about 24 hours. So, you know, after about 24 hours, you can lay down again and, and, and maybe sleep some. But you sweat. Um, you throw up. You have all, I mean, you just have, there's, there's so many issues. But after seven days, those are supposed to be over. That's what detox is, the detoxification of your body. And what's rehab? Rehab is the period that, that you go to learn how to stay off. You know, you supposedly off after detox. Rehab is where you get help staying off. 
And uh, before September 2021, had you ever gone to that second stage of rehab? No. So in June, excuse me, December 2017, how long did it take you to relapse uh, once you got home from detox? Not long at all. I mean, you're still going through, you know, this physical dependency is gone. You still have, I mean, you're still so sick. I mean, you just. Is that something you've been battling for quite some time? As long as I can remember. How long have you been drug free, opioid free? 535 days. And I'm very proud of that. I want to ask you uh, questions about Labor Day weekend 2021. Okay. Do you, do you remember being confronted by your law firm? Sure, I do. And what were you confronted about? Stealing money. And did you admit your misconduct to your law partners? Well, to one of my law partners and one of my and my brother and my law partner, so Danny and Randy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, did admit it, admit it. Now. And they they learned about a fake forge account. Did you you admit to the fake forge account? Yes, I did. And. Did you tell them about your opioid struggles, opioid addiction? I told them about my addiction, yes, sir. Um, to your knowledge, were any of your law partners aware of your addiction? Not just to my knowledge. I'm certain that they were not aware of my addiction. How would you char characterize your, your opioid use or addiction? Severe, moderate? Uh, then or now? No, in, tw in 2020, 2021? I mean, I, I don't know how I would have characterized it then. After going to rehab and learning um, more of the things I've learned, um, really talking to addicts about experiences, I mean, I, I will tell you that my addiction was extremely, extremely bad. How were you able to function? Or were you able to function? Yes, I was able to function. You, you were able to practice law? Yes. And were you successful practicing law while you were addicted to opioids? I, I, on some level, yes, sir, I was successful. I mean, I... After you were confronted on uh, Labor Day weekend 2021, did, did you resign or were you forced to resign from a law firm? Absolutely. And then on um, Saturday, September the 4th, um, do you remember what happened that day? Saturday, September 4th, yes, sir, I remember. And what, what happened? Start when I woke up. Well, let's start after you met with Chris Wilson. Did you meet with Chris Wilson? I met with Chris Wilson at my mom's and dad's house in uh, Almeida. And, and did you lay it out for Chris Wilson, your opioid addiction and your misconduct? I, I, I definitely laid out my uh, addiction. I, I definitely gave him some details about um, monies that I had taken. I didn't give him we didn't go into okay. all the details about all of it, but I, I certainly was very candid with him about the things that involved him. Had had you already just contacted the the detox facility um, before you met with Chris Wilson on the fourth? I, I believe that we had already um, at, at that point. I believe that we had already already. Uh, spoken to the guy that I knew from Sunrise and made arrangements for me to go there on Monday. Okay. And um, I know we had arrangements for me to go there on Monday and I, I, I'm, I'm 
So we had to have had it by then because I went to the hospital shortly after that. So yes. And and did you reach out to Blanca to get your insurance information? I did. And, and for what purpose? Um, because I was going to use my insurance at uh, detox and rehab to help pay for it. Okay. And and what would what was your immediate plans um, after? I mean, for the day after you met with Chris Wilson, did you have plans to do anything? Have any other meetings um, on that Saturday? I, I wanted to go and meet with Corey Fleming, who was another lawyer who was affected by the things I did. Okay. And did you? And a good friend. Did you go meet with Corey Fleming? No. What'd you, what'd you do instead? I'd given my, when, when I gave my pills to my brother Randy and Danny, I, I think I gave them to Randy, but I'd taken, I took a, I took a lot of pills because I knew I wasn't going to be taking anymore. So um, Randy had my pills. I had to get some from him the night before, but I only got a small amount. Um, I, I, I could tell, you know, I, I wasn't taking anything near like what I had been taking, so I knew it was coming. Um, and I called someone to bring me more pills. And um, before I, I believe before I met with Chris Wilson. And did you you meet this? Did the person you called bring you more pills? Um, you know, I don't know if he brought me more pills or not because by the time I met with him, um, after meeting with Chris and after, you know, the starting of the withdrawals, I changed my plans. And, wh and what, what was the change in plans? not to get pills from him anymore and instead I asked him to shoot me. Did you ask him to shoot you as a sympathy ploy or did you want As a sympathy to ploy? Yes sir. Why no. did you ask him to shoot you? What was, what was the end goal in your, that you wanted to accomplish? I meant for him to shoot me so I'd be gone. And who was this? Who did you ask to do this? Eddie Smith. And did he in fact shoot you? He did. And where, 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 where was that located? Not your gunshot, but where were you shot in Hampton and Colleton County? Where, where, where were you? It's Hampton County. It's, um, it's, it's right on the border of Sockahatchee Road. It runs right along the Sockahatchee River. Um, And, and why did you want to be gone? I mean, I knew all this was coming to a head. I knew how humiliating it was going to be for my son. Um, I mean, I'd been through so much. At the time, in the bad place that I was, it seemed like a better thing to do. I don't think that way now, thankfully, but right. I did at the time. Did you have life insurance on you? Oh yeah, I had a lot of life insurance. And who was the beneficiary? Um, Maggie was the beneficiary. How much life insurance did you have? I had $12 million. I had a $4 million policy and a $12 million, and an $8 million po policy, a total of 12. Did you ever have any life insurance on Maggie? No, never. Did you ever have any life insurance on Paul? No. Alex, will you, 
tell this jury about Maggie and your relationship with her? No. Y'all saw a picture. She was just as beautiful inside as she was outside. And um, I mean, she was so adventurous. I mean, she, you couldn't tell her something was good or bad. I mean, she wanted to find out for herself. She wanted to do it, see it, experience it uh, on her own and form her own opinion. Um, she was devoted. Um, those two boys, Buster, Paul, me, I mean, I mean, she made sure we didn't want for anything, ever. Um, fun, playful. I mean, she had a laugh that, um, you know, you didn't even have to know what was funny. If you heard her laugh, you would laugh. Um, You know, she had this little playful look where she'd smile at you and bite her lip. I can't do it, but I mean, when she'd just do it, it'd just melt you. Um, you know, she was such a lady, such a feminine person, a girl. But then she had two boys, and I mean, she didn't grow up in the swamp and in the country, um, riding four wheelers and hunting and fishing. And I mean, she she changed everything. She she um, she um, I mean, she became a boy's mom. I mean, her life became ball and. Riding four wheelers and I mean doing those things. Now, don't get me wrong, she was still a hundred percent girl and you, you heard Marion say, I mean, she loved to do those things with her nieces, but I mean she threw herself into her boy's life. I mean you know, she never took not working uh for granted. I mean she I mean she might not have worked. But I promise you, she worked. And she worked to make sure me and Paul and Buster had everything. Um, you know, she, um, she wanted a big family. And pregnancy just didn't suit her. I mean, her pregnancies were so hard. I would leave her in the mornings and she'd be sick. I'd come home and check on her and she'd be sick. I come back at the end of the day and she'd be sick. I mean, she was so sick all the time with both those boys. And and um when we had Paw Paw, Maggie got in trouble and Paw Paw got in trouble. And um just pregnancy didn't suit her, so we decided that you know, we would just have the two boys. And, you know, I, I just think how hard it was on her. Just made her love those boys so much more. And she did. But she was the kind of person, Maggie, you know, she could put on the most elegant ball gown and go to the governor's mansion and hang out with 
you know, the most affluent people, whatever. Or she could come down to, you know, she could go to um, a food bank in Hampton or Walterburg and fit in. Everybody at both places would say when she left, and that Maggie, she's a good one. She's just a special person. Alan, Very would you, special person. Would you, do, would you ever do anything to harm Maggie? I would never hurt Maggie. Ever. Will you tell the jury about Paul, please, and your relationship with him? And Paul, Paul. I mean, Paul, Paul was just the brightest. He was bright. He's the most inquisitive young man. He wanted to be a part of everything. If you were working, I can remember as a little boy, you'd be working on something. It didn't matter what it was. His little head was going to come in there, his nose in there to see what you were doing. Um, he was a man's man. He was a 100% country boy. He was tough. I mean, he, he could hunt anything. He could catch any fish. He could run any piece of equipment. He could use any tool. Um, I mean, he could do anything. Uh, he, at, at 22 years old, he could do so many things. I mean, he took care um, of so many, and he was so tough. But on the other hand, he had a side to him that was just so sweet. I mean, he wouldn't come home where he wouldn't go check on his grandparents. He wouldn't go near Somerville where he wouldn't go out of his way, check on his grandparents. Um, you know, to be such a tough person, he would get all his buddies and get on a boat and go watch a sunset. I mean, 22 year old people, you know, do stuff like that. I mean, he was such a special boy. Um, he cared about people. He was fiercely, fiercely loyal. He was so misrepresented in the media. I mean, never, never an accurate story told about what he was. And I'll challenge you right now. I, I, I would challenge everybody in this room to go find somebody, somebody that knew Papa, who really knew him, that did not have an ulterior motive that would say something negative about him. And I challenge everybody who can hear me now to do that. I mean, Paul was that kind of person. If you knew him, he would help you. And he would be glad to help you. Um... You know, I thought Mark Ball made a good point when he said, you know, Paul Paul might not have, he might not have quite found his place yet. Paul was ADD, ADHD, and so he would jump around from thing to thing a lot. But there's absolutely no question in my mind whatsoever that Paul Paul would have found whatever that thing was that he was going to do. And whatever that ended up being, he was going to be one of the best at it that, that you've ever known. And I'll tell you one more thing. I didn't even know this when Paul was alive. But, excuse me. Um, excuse me. Um, when, when, when they were doing his eulogy, I gave it the names of some of his friends. And he had a real cute friend that they were just friends, but a cute little girl that Maggie adored. I didn't know her very well, but Maggie did. Maggie adored her, but they talked to her, and, and Paul, they, we learned this from her. 
Julianne, and at 22 years old, learned. I mean, Paul Paul would tell his friends, be present, appreciate where you are, the things you have, and the people around you. I think a lot of that came from it hurt Paul so bad when Mallory died. But I mean, 22 year olds, do you know that think that way? Be present. Appreciate things around you. At 22 years old. Alec, He's the most special boy. Do you love Paul? Did I love him? Like no other. He and Buster. Do you love Maggie? More than anything. I love Maggie from the first time we went out. Did you kill Maggie? No, I did not kill Maggie. I did not kill Paul. I would never hurt Maggie, and I would never hurt Paul, ever, under any circumstances. Thank you. Please answer any questions. <coughs> they may have. Sir. Thank you. Gentlemen, we'll take a. Excuse me, gentlemen. We'll take a ten-minute recess. Please do not discuss the case. Do not discuss your testimony during the recess. Ten minutes.
be seated. You may bring the jury. Thank you. Cross-examination. Please court. Mr. Murdoch, let's start with a few things I think we can agree on. All right, sir. You agree that the most important part of your testimony here today is explaining your life for a year and a half that you were never down at those kennels at 844. Would you agree with that? I think all of my testimony is important, Mr. Waters. Would you agree that that's an important part of your testimony? Sure. All right. And would you also agree that the first time that law enforcement officers that you've talked to and the prosecution and here in open court ever heard you say that you lied about being in the kennels was today in this court? Yes, I'm aware of that. You would agree with that? Yes, sir. All right. All this time later, this is the first time you've ever said that? Yes, sir. Then you would agree to me, with me that for years you were stealing money from clients? Yes, sir. I agree with that. And that you were stealing from your law firm? Yes, sir. I agree with that. And that had been going on since at least 2010? I'm not sure of the exact date, but it's been going on a long time. I'll agree with All that. Right, what's your best guess of the date? I'm not sure. I, I, have, don't I, I don't take a dispute with 2010. I just don't know that for sure. All right. I'm sure about a lot of things, but you don't know that. Is that correct? I, I'm fine with that date, Mr. Okay. Waters. I, I don't have any reason to dispute it. I'm just not certain of it. All right. Let's, let's just keep on things that we may be able to agree about. And let's talk first about your family's legacy here in the legal profession, okay? Talk about anything you want to. Good. Uh, tell me about your uh, great-grandfather. Was he the solicitor for the very circuit that we're in? Yes, sir. And what was his name? Randolph Murdoch Sr. All right. Did he, what did he go by? Do you know? Randolph. Randolph. And... Did you ever get to know him, or did he pass before? Oh, no, sir. He got killed in 1940. And how long was he solicitor? 20 years. 20 years? Yes, sir. And then your grandfather, who was that? Randolph Murdoch, Jr. All right. And did he go by, what did he go by? Buster. That's who Buster is named after. My, and was he solicitor? 
Yes, sir. He was the solicitor for 46, 46 years. From 1940, he took over. When my great-granddaddy got killed, and he served until 1986. Okay. He was the longest-serving prosecutor in the country. And you knew him, obviously, well. He was your grandfather, correct? Oh, I knew him extremely well and loved him dearly. Idolized him, did you not? Yes. Yeah. You know, so he was the chief dearly. prosecutor for all that time as well, is that correct? Yes, sir. And then your father, Mr. Randolph, he became solicitor not long after that, is that correct? When my grandfather retired because you weren't allowed to be solicitor after age 72, my dad took over, filled his unexpired term, and then he ran. And he became the chief prosecutor for this, this area right here as well? Yes, sir. And how long was he solicitor? From 1986 until 2006. Until 2006? Yes, sir. I actually worked a case with him about a guy who killed a trooper. He's a fine, fine, fine man. Yes, he was. an excellent lawyer. Yes, he was. And he was an excellent lawyer, right? Yes, sir. That's a big part of your, your family legacy and your heritage that's so ingrained around here is that history of being the chief prosecutor and being part of the, the central part of the legal community. Is that correct? Would you agree with that? That my family's been a central part of the legal community? Yes, sir, I agree with that. And not only just the central part of the legal community, but the chief prosecutor for this area since 1910, I think, up until 2006? 1920. 1920. 2006, 1910 is when my great-grandfather started the law firm. The law firm. Yes, okay. sir. All right, so 1920 to 2006, correct? That's correct. An unbroken chain of being the chief prosecutor here, correct? That's correct. And then you went to law school as well, is that right? Yes, sir. And when did you uh, graduate from law school? 1994. 1994. And <clears throat> did you ever become a full-time solicitor? No, sir. All right. And you, so you went into private practice, I think, with Mawson Coon, is that right? Yes, sir. And then you went to the former law firm that no longer exists because of your activities, correct? I started in 1994. Answer my question, if you would, please, first. What was your question? My question was that you started first with Moss and Coon. Go ahead and answer that one. Yes, that's correct. And then you went to the law firm that doesn't exist anymore that started in 19, but it doesn't exist anymore because of your activities, correct? That's correct. And as part of that, of your practice, you were a trial lawyer, correct? That's correct. Successful trial lawyer. I don't know about your adjective, but I, I was, you know, I guess so, yes, sir. Do you make millions of dollars in legal fees? Yes, sir. But you won't tell this jury that's successful? Well, if, if, that's, if that's the criteria, yes, sir, I was successful. Okay. Well, you won cases, correct? I did win cases. Settled cases? Sure, I settled cases. Okay. Heard your former law partner say that you were a successful lawyer? I did hear some of them say that. Right. I think you even became president of the Trial Lawyers Association, is that right? That's correct. And when was that? I'm not sure of the exact year, but it would have been uh, in the 2015 range, 2014, 15, 16, somewhere in there. And in that role, you were kind of uh, the president of the association of people who do trial plaintiff's work, right? Yes, sir. Who do jury trials, correct? Well, that, I mean, that's that, part of it, right? Yes, sir, that, that's, that's part of it. That's part of it. Sitting down, looking jurors in the eyes, and giving a closing argument. Is that right? Yes. And what kind of uh, cases did you normally do? What, what, just generally what subject matter? I, I did all kinds of cases. I did cases that, I mean, I, I handled some very big cases. Um, you know, I had a lot of cases where, you know, somebody, their, their cable company was billing them $20 more than they should have been. And I handled everything from that 
to the big cases and everything in between. All right, so the big cases, tell me about those. Those were typically plaintiff's work, all plaintiff's work, correct, for your big cases? Yes. Okay. And plaintiff's work is where, or there would be, say, for example, uh, automobile or truck accidents, correct? Or that some of it? All, every big case I ever had was automobile. No, I mean, no, sir. Not all of them were automobile wrecks. Were many of them? Sure. All right. And if they, let's say, a, your, your plaintiff collided with a, like a UPS truck or a tractor trailer or something like that, you've had cases like that, correct? I have. And they led to very big recoveries, is that correct? The UPS case that I handled? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. And as a part of that, um, developing those types of cases, you were involved in investigating the facts of the case, correct? Yes. All right. And you were involved in gathering, let's say, telemetry data from automobiles, correct? Telemetry data, like you presented in this courtroom this week? Yeah. You never did that? I've never had a case specifically where the type data that y'all have presented in this case that I've used, but I've had data from automobiles. I've had okay. from their essentially their computer. Own star right. data. I've had data from the black box, mm -hmm. you know, but specifically telemetry data. I don't believe that I've ever had one of those. But on star and black box data, correct? Um more so the black box event recorder. I mean, many times in a wreck, the, the event recorder will go back and tell you things leading up to the wreck. Sure. So, and I've been in numerous cases where those were involved. And you've had cases where cell phone evidence was relevant to your case? Sure. People's call logs were relevant to your case? I have had those. Cell tower location was relevant to your case? Yes. Computer evidence was relevant to your case? I'm sure I have, yes. And when did you start with the uh, law firm? August or September of 1998. And you've been doing essentially that kind of work, more or less, up until September of 2021, correct? That's correct. To the point where you rose to be the president of the Trial Lawyers Association. I was the president of the Trial Lawyers Association in around 2015, as we discussed. So can we agree now on successful? I mean, by those criteria, I was successful, certainly. I mean, I, I, we talked about a lot of my flaws here today, too. Do I feel like I was successful? No, sir. Not sitting here today, I don't. But it, it, if you want to use that term and, and on, on those criteria, I, I don't have any problem with you saying at that time it looked like I was successful. Do you think people viewed you as a, as a successful lawyer? I'm sure there were a lot of people that did. Do you think people viewed your family as very prominent? I believe that there were a lot of people that did, yes, sir. And did you think that a lot of people viewed you and your family as very prominent in the legal community here? I never thought of myself as prominent. I asked you if you thought if people viewed you that way. Let me ask At you At the this. time, did I think people viewed yeah. me that way? Yeah, prior to everything happening. No, I, I don't think that I thought people viewed me as prominent. No, sir. I mean, uh, like a big shot? No, sir, I don't think that. What about your family? That my family thought we were big shots? No, sir, I definitely view don't think that. your family as prominent in this community? Prominent? Yeah. As in? It's not a hard question. Well, I, I'm just not sure, you know, I think my family was very well thought of. Mm -hmm. I think my family was respected. Yeah. I think my family helped a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not challenging you on any of that. I'm just getting you to agree what seems to be a basic fact. Would you agree with that? With what? That my family helped a lot of people that and was well thought of? Prominent. If, if, if that's what you mean by that, yes, sir. And that your family had a very long association with law enforcement? Yes, sir. And you had a long association with law enforcement? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, by, by association, I assume you're talking about friendships. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, but not I, only not only just friendships, but also professional as well, correct? As a prosecutor? Professional associations with law enforcement. As a prosecutor or as let's, a civil talk, attorney? Okay, let's talk about civil. Did you have associations with them in civil cases? Sure. I mean, uh, as we discussed, a lot of cases that I handled were wreck cases or might be a train wreck or a tractor trail, but there were a lot of highway patrolmen involved. There were a lot of local law enforcement involved. So, yeah, we mm -hmm. dealt with a lot of law enforcement in the civil practice. All right. And then you also mentioned that you were a prosecutor as well, correct? I was a volunteer assistant solicitor. Uh, did, your, uh, did you or your family or your law firm ever have events or parties or social affairs in which uh, the law enforcement community in this area was invited? I mean, sure. We, the, the law firm itself didn't really sponsor things like that. Right. But there would be occasions where one of us in the law firm, and certainly we all had a lot of friends in law enforcement, and they were always invited. Okay. And it's a simple point. You had a lot of friends in law enforcement, your family, and you had a long association with the law enforcement community in this circuit. Is that correct? Association being friendships and working relationships, absolutely. Okay. All right, well, let's talk about being a prosecutor. When did you become an assistant solicitor? I believe that I became an assistant solicitor when I moved from Beaufort to Hampton. Right. So that would have been September, sometime around September 9, 1998. Might have been a little bit after that, but sometime. Did you get a badge when you came an assistant solicitor? At some point I did, yes, sir. And who gave you that badge? My father. Mr. Randolph? Yes, sir. And over the years, uh, did you prosecute criminal cases, much as what's going on here today? Uh, yes, sir. At times I did. And I believe that I prosecuted in, from 1998 to 2001. I believe that 2001? I. Keep going. I'm sorry. I mean, 2021. Okay. I'm sorry. Until 2021. From 1998 to 2021, I believe I was involved in five jury. I believe, I, I believe there were five trials. Five trials is, is the best that I can remember, and that, all with my all with my dad. That was really the purpose of me being assistant solicitor was get to spend time with him, do things with him. Sure. And you five jury trials over all that time, but you had a badge that entire time. Is that correct? I had a badge for a big part of that time. Yes, sir. You actually had two badges, right? I had one badge, <clears throat> but my my when my granddad became an assistant solicitor for my dad, when my dad became the solicitor, he had an assistant solicitor's badge. Right. When he passed away, I had his badge, and that was one of, at some point in time, you were asking somebody about two badges, and that was the other badge. I got you. Um, you said you did five criminal jury trials as a prosecutor, correct? Assisted in those, or was doing them, yes, sir. I believe I was actually the lead lawyer in one of them. I helped my dad in the other four. Still part of preparing the case? Yes, sir. Still part of uh, gathering the evidence and putting it together for trial? Um, in, in a criminal case, we didn't do much of the gathering of the evidence. We took what law enforcement had gathered, but... But putting, putting it together for the criminal trial, correct? Yes, sir. Presenting evidence in court? Yes, sir. Giving jury argument? Mm, I, did in, I, I did the closing argument in one of them, yes, sir. Did you ever have any cases that you prosecuted that uh, went short of a jury trial, either pled out or were dismissed for some reason? You know, I'm sure that at some point over between 1998 and 2021 that I took some plea but as we sit here today, I can't specifically remember that, and I don't ever remember working a case up for trial that didn't go to trial. Got but it. I'm sure at some point in time, I was involved in some level on a, on a guilty plea, or guilty pleas. And you'd agree with me that the civil system and the criminal system have a lot of differences, correct? A lot of differences and a lot of similarities. And a lot of similarities, and that's where I was going next. That fundamentally, it's about 
analyzing the evidence, preparing for trial, presenting that case, and making your argument to the jury, correct? That's, that's a big part of it. Okay. And would you agree with me that as cases go on, uh, or as you pre are preparing for trial, that you analyze the evidence that's been gathered by law enforcement and present the evidence that, uh, that supports your case, correct? That's just part of it. Presenting evidence that you deem favorable for your position? Yeah, that you analyze the evidence and then you, you put in the evidence that supports your case. It's an ongoing process. Would yeah, you agree with that? That's, that's, that's part of what you do. And same thing in the civil case, right? As you go along, you may have evidence, uh, but you ultimately analyze that evidence and some evidence makes the cut and some of it does not. Is that fair to say? As far as what you're trying to, I, I, I think we agree question. on that. We would agree on that. I think so. I'm not exactly sure what your question is, but I think I understand it. I'm just asking you that as a lawyer, as yes, you've been since 1994, is that right? That, that's correct. It's a simple question. You analyze the evidence that's been gathered, whether civil or criminal, and then present that in court. Is that correct? Yes, right. that's part of and what that you do. That is an ongoing process as you prepare for a case. Is that correct? An ongoing process as you prepare for in criminal courts or civil courts? Either one. Well, I mean, but there's there's a distinction because in civil court you have the deadlines, and so you aren't allowed to gather evidence during a trial or a week before a trial or. Um, you know, for, for instance, if this was a civil trial and we found that OnStar data mm -hmm. during the third or fourth week of trial, we wouldn't be able to use it because you're past deadlines. But in a criminal case, you are able to use it. But you would agree that none of that was the fault of anyone on this side of the table, that GM initially responded they had nothing and then responded all of a sudden that they did. I, I don't have an opinion, and that's certainly not anything I'm intending to convey. You, you talk to this jury a lot about that, but you know nothing about that particular part of it. Is that what you're telling us? Talk. You talk to, to the jury a lot about the GM data, but you're telling me that you're unaware that, that GM initially responded to law enforcement's timely request and said they didn't have that, but then in the course of the trial, all of a sudden came up and said, you know what, we found something, and that's the reason why it arrived late. You're saying you don't know anything about that after talking to this jury about that? I, I don't know a single thing about that. I know that y'all represented that to the court, and I don't have any reason to doubt it. Okay. Good. But I, I, don't, I don't... And you would agree that that's generally consistent with the telemetry data that the FBI did, correct? The OnStar data. That the OnStar, I think the OnStar data and the telemetry data are totally different. All right, you don't you don't think they're generally consistent with one another? Is that what you're telling the jury? No, no, I'm not telling the jury anything about that. I'm just saying, you, you, do I think they're consistent? I think they're telling. I think the OnStar data tells one gives gives you one set of information, and the telemetry data gives you another set of information. Okay. But you don't think they're consistent? Um, I mean, you talked I, about I, I it to this jury. I, is it, it, I think we're struggling on what seems to be a fairly simple point. Don't you agree? Mr. Warden, I'm just trying to answer your question. Right. And, and so I, I'm not trying to be difficult. I, I just, I, my understanding of what, what you're referring to as the telemetry data is when a car goes into park and drive and that sort of thing is that what you're referring to yes and the gps information is telling you where a vehicle is on a certain path correct and what direction it's going so i think that they're they're just two they're two different types of information the question I, was were they consistent with one another i don't I, I i guess so i don't think they contradict each other all right thank you all right um You were the breadwinner for your family, correct? For your immediate family? Yes. And that included, obviously, for Maggie, correct? I'm sorry? That included for Maggie, correct? Absolutely. And in large measure for Buster and Paul as well. Would you agree with that? Did I, I was the breadwinner? The primary breadwinner, yes. 
No, I, I was I was their source of. I, I was the source of income for Maggie, Buster, and Paul. Okay. I mean, I guess as they got older, um, I mean, there's some point where Buster had a job, but I mean, I, I would still consider myself the provider for for them at that time. Okay. I mean, again, this I'm not. There's no trick here. I'm just trying to ask a simple I, I, question. Mr. Waters, I don't think you, I don't think that was a trick. No, okay. So. All right. so you were the primary breadwinner. We can agree on that. Yes, right? sir. Right. Go ahead. Um, give me one second. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as uh, States 570 and see if you recognize this particular uh, item. You can go ahead and take it out of the bag. Out of the bag. All right, sir. You know what that is? Yes, sir. That's 571? Yes, sir. All right. And then I'm going to show you what was in the bag 570. Can you tell me what that is? I can. All right, what is that? Which one? 570, what is that? All right, 571 is what I would consider to be my badge. All right, and then what is this one right here, which is 570? Okay, 570 would be the one I told you about was my grandfather's badge after he retired, when he became an assistant for my dad. Your Honor, this time I'd offer states 571 and 570 in the evidence. Here, I admit it. Where did you keep 570, the one that was your grandfather's? It didn't have a single place that it was kept. you know where it was recovered by law enforcement? No, sir. Would, it, would you dispute if it was recovered out of the Mercedes you were driving on September 4th, the day of the side of the road incident? No, I believe that. Can I have the Elmo, please? Now the screen, please. <clears throat> and 571, where did you where'd you keep this one? Usually in my car. Where in your car? It could be all of it. It could be on the dash like you were talking to Mark Ball about. It could be in the center console. It could be in the cup holder. It could be on the seat. Be on, it, it, usually in the front seat, but... In, in my car is where I tried to keep it. And when you had it in your dash, would you have it face up or face down? I didn't have any particular manner in which I stored it anywhere. It, there was no rhyme or reason to it is what you're telling the jury? How you had it in the dash? There may be occasions where I had it in the dash for some particular reason, but there were a lot of times where it probably was in the dash for no particular reason other than that's where I put it. Just like I might put it on the seat or in the cup holder. You said there were particular reasons why you might put it in the dash, what would those reasons be? I mean, it could be any number of things. If I'm going somewhere where I want somebody to see it, um, then I would put it in the dash. If there's another reason for some, somebody to see it, like for instance, if I get pulled over, I, I might have it in the cup holder so an officer could see it when he walked up. Now why would you do that? Why would you have it in the cup holder? You're not saying you were on official business, are you? No, I'm not saying I'm on official business. Why would you want it in a cup holder if you got pulled over? Because I found that law enforcement oftentimes is friendlier when you're in law enforcement. When you're law enforcement. So you considered yourself law enforcement? Uh, no, sir. I, I can't say that I considered myself law enforcement. Well, you carried a badge on you 
as an assistant solicitor for two decades, roughly? From around 98, so yes, sir, for two decades. And you would ride with it sometimes sitting in the front dash facing out, correct? That's correct. And you would put it in the cup holder so that law enforcement would see you if you got pulled over, right? That's correct. Okay, so but you're, you didn't consider yourself law enforcement? I personally didn't consider myself to be law enforcement, no, sir. All right, so you were just using having this badge to your advantage and taking, taking license with it, is that correct? I guess in some circumstances that is accurate. See if you could use it to get away with something, correct? Get better treatment if you got pulled over. Get better treatment if I got pulled over? I mean, that's, that's probably a fair statement. Okay. That, yeah, if somebody in law enforcement saw that, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's true. <clears throat> Did you uh, have to take an oath when you got that badge? No, sir. You didn't? Not that I remember. I, I, I don't, I, I certainly don't recall taking one, like, so going somewhere and um, raising my hand. Raising your hand and saying, I promise to do my duty fairly and with integrity. You never had to do that? Um, Mr. Waters, if I did, I sure don't recall it. I mean, it was a very informal process when I became a volunteer assistant solicitor for my dad. And then when I continued with Duffy, I mean, at some point, um, you know, if, if I took any oath at all that I can remember, it would be on some paper that um, I may have had to sign, but I don't specifically remember doing that. All right. Well, let's talk about it. Let's go back to 571. And on the inside of it, what are those right there? Are those the, uh, an ID card with your picture on it? Uh, yes, sir, that is. All right, and at the top, on that top, leave it in there if you would, please. Can you not see it? I can, but I was just going to see what's on the back. Okay. All right, sir. All right, and it's got your picture on it, got your name on it? Uh, yes, sir, that does have my picture and my name. Go put that one back for me, please. All right. So you want to look right. at this top one? Look at the top one. Okay. What what office does it say that you are on that top one right there? Up there at the top. State of South Carolina solicitor, the solicitor of the 14th Judicial Circuit. It says that I, as solicitor of the 14th Judicial Circuit, I do hereby certify that and it has your name. Right. Mm -hmm. And it has all that data. Uh, what, what position does it say that you're appointed to? As the, okay, it says that as solicitor of the 14th Judicial Circuit, I do certify that Richard A. Murdoch was on July 1st, 2013, appointed as the deputy solicitor of Allendale, Beaufort, Colleton, Hampton, and Jasper counties in and is authorized to enforce the laws in the 14th Judicial Circuit of South Carolina. Okay, awesome. Can I hold it back? And it's, yes, sir. Signed by Duffy Stone. Signed by Duffy Stone. So deputy solicitor, is that correct? I was never a deputy solicitor, Mr. Waters. That's what that says, but I, I, I've never been a, a deputy solicitor. Unless deputy solicitor is, I was a volunteer assistant solicitor. And as far as I know, Sean Thornton has been the only deputy solicitor that Duffy Stone had. And it's a simple point. It says deputy solicitor, but deputy solicitor is a higher rank than assistant solicitor, correct? To your understanding? That's what I think. Yeah. And, and, and that was Sean Thornton. I've, I've never been deputy solicitor, even though that does say that. All right. I agree with you. And that was signed by Duffy Stone, not by me. I understand. This is what was given to you. That's what it was given to I went mean, through this whole long thing at the beginning about whether or not you had an association with law, the law enforcement community, but this was given to you not by your father, but by a successor, correct? Well, no, sir. I believe we got to this because you were talk, asking me if I took an oath, and mm -hmm. I don't remember taking the oath, and then you started asking me about these things. Okay. And you agree that this card says deputy solicitor, right? I agree that card says deputy solicitor. All right. 
Would you agree with me that it says on the back that it is reposing special trust and confidence in your ability, care, prudence, and integrity? Is that what it says on the back of this? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're, no, sir, I mean, I, I trust, if you're reading that off the back of that, I, I assume that it does. You were reading off of the one that uh, the one that Duffy Stone gave me, correct? Yeah, and then the one at the top. Where did that one come from? You want me to bring it back to you? No, sir. I think I can see it. That it's would not be not focused very well. That's okay. I mean, I, I I I know what it is. I looked at it when you handed it to me. So the, the the card on the bottom is what I got from Duffy Stone. The one on the top, and and, and the one on the top should give you a better. Uh, there we go. All right, so the one on the top was what came from my dad when he was solicitor. The one on the bottom is what came from Duffy Stone when he was solicitor. And Duffy Stone took over after my dad retired in 2006. Duffy Stone filled my dad's unexpired, the rest of his unexpired four-year term, much like my dad filled my granddad. So, and then Duffy became the solicitor. Did you ever have lights in your vehicle? In the, in the particular vehicle? No, that, in, any, in vehicle. any vehicle. Yes, sir, I did. Was that a government vehicle? Uh, no, sir, it was not. When did you have lights, like blue lights and stuff? Yes, sir, I had some blue lights. When did you have blue lights? And let me remember, you did five cases over 20 years, and you had blue lights in your vehicle, but it was a private, it was your private vehicle, correct? Well, it, it was the vehicle that I drove. It was a law firm-owned vehicle. The law firm's own vehicle. So how would you get blue lights in there? I had them installed. And who installed them? I believe that uh, Eddie Gibson installed them. And who was that? He's the guy who um, apparently does uh, blue light work for most of the sheriff's departments in the 14th Circuit and a lot of the um, police departments. And did you, when did you have that installed, do you recall? Was Can't, it one vehicle or more than one vehicle? Let's start with that. I believe I had it in, I believe I had blue lights in one vehicle. And when did you have that installed, do you think? I'm not sure. It would have been... I mean, the, five years, ten years? No, nah, here, here I can give you a time frame. Okay. The vehicle that I was in, on that, that, that got uh, taken in on June the 7th, mm -hmm. I got that vehicle sometime around Dece late December or January, so I'd had it for six months. Mm -hmm. I would have had the previous vehicle for five years. That's how long we kept vehicles in the law firm so i would have had it for five years and it and and sometime during that five-year period i had lights installed did you ask the sheriff at the time if you could do that i did who was that i believe it was tc smalls mm -hmm. um and i believe in colleton it was andy strickland in colleton it was andy strickland and i believe in allendale it was tom carter <clears throat> Were you friends with Andy Strickland? Yeah, I was friends with Andy Strickland. And you, you said, hey, I'm going to get some blue lights and install my vehicle, and he said, that's cool. Or words to that effect. I mean, that doesn't sound like the words that he would have used or I would have used, but I certainly asked him, and he certainly said it was okay. It was okay. All right. along with Sheriff Smalls and I believe Sheriff Carter. I'm not positive about Sheriff Carter, but I believe so. Hmm. 
I'll show you just real quick. What's been marked as states 507. Let's see if you recognize that. I believe this is my suburban. Um, yeah, this is this is my suburban that um, that y'all had. Okay. Was that does that look like where your badge was on the day of the incident? I have no idea. You don't recall putting it there? No, but I, I, I don't take issue with the fact that it's, I don't take issue with the fact that it's there if that's that, you know, if that's what, how they say it was. I found it and that's a picture. Your Honor, it states 507 in evidence. No objection. So admitted. You, um, testified some about the boat case, and we'll talk more about that uh, boat later. Boat case being, I'm sorry. The boat wreck case. Can we agree that that's what we're talking about when we say the boat case? February in 2019? Well, there, there, there's two things. You, you referring to the civil case when you say the boat case, okay. but when I think about the boat case I think about the charges that y'all brought against Papa okay so but they're uh, also the civil case mm -hmm. all right uh, Paul Paul that's what that was your name for Paul I mean that I, I called him Paul Paul Maggie called him Paul Paul bus calls him Paul Paul sure Roro calls him Paul Paul I mean that's Roro. Not, that's who not, is Roro Ro, that's Rogan Gibson okay and this jury, of course, has heard multiple recorded statements of you during the course of this. Did you ever refer to Paul as Paul Paul during that? I don't know. You don't, do you recall? How I referred to, to I, I can say Paul if you prefer that. No, I, I, you can call him whatever you want. I'm just asking you if you ever called him that during the course of that entire investigation. Or is that also the first time today, at least publicly? Is today the first time I've called my son Paul Paul Paul? No, sir, that is not correct. Have you ever called him that on all the recorded statements that this jury has heard? I don't know. You ever called Rogan Roro? -Ro I called all him the Ro -Ro recorded Ro statements. All the time. And the recorded statements, did you ever call him that? I don't know. I mean, I called him Rogan also, so I, I don't know. But I, I, I'm happy to call him Rogan, and I'm happy to call Paul Paul. Um, all right, well, let's talk about, and I'll be, I'll be specific with the boat race, wreck criminal case and the boat wreck civil case, okay? Is yes, that sir. fair? Yes, sir. All right. And we've talked a little bit about your badge. Did you have your badge with you on the night of the boat wreck? On the night of the, on the night of the boat wreck, did I have it with me? Yeah. When? Did you go to the hospital that night? I did go to the hospital that night. Did you have it with you then? I don't know, but I don't believe so. But I, I, I really don't, you don't know. believe so. But when you went to the hospital on the night of the boat wreck, were you acting in any official capacity? The night of the, when I went to the hospital, was I yeah. acting in an official capacity? Yes. No, sir. Okay. Show you what's been marked as states 569 and do you recognize the person on the right in that image no sir you don't recognize that I, I don't recognize him no I'm asking about that oh me is that you yeah it looks like me all right what's hanging out of your pocket in plain view looks like a badge you didn't recall that until I just showed you that picture no sir I did not 
Your Honor, it offers states 569 in the evidence. Okay. Admit it. That's you in the white shirt, is that right? Yes, sir, it is. And this is the badge hanging out at your pocket. Do you remember which, is that correct? Looks to be, yes, sir. Which badge is that? Which one of the two, do you remember? No, nah, you can't tell from here. Okay. And why'd you have it hanging out of your pocket like that? I don't remember having that. No, I, I don't know. You don't remember that? I, I don't remember that, no, sir. Did you generally walk around with your badge hanging out of your pocket? Generally speaking, no, sir, I did not. Or only when you wanted some advantage from it. Did I? Did, did you I want some advantage from wearing it like that? Did I hang it out in my pocket when I wanted an advantage? Yes. I, I, I may have. Okay. I certainly may have. Right. What advantage did you want? When? Then. I don't even recall this, Mr. Waters, but. If I was wanting some advantage, as you say it, yeah. I guess, and I don't remember this, but I guess I would want, uh, you know, as I said, a, a badge has a warming effect with other law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so if I was seeking any advantage, as you say, then I guess that would be what it was. Do you ever want to be the solicitor? Yeah, there was a time period where I did. Did you ever want to be the, the solicitor? The yeah, that was a, solicitor? there was a time period when I absolutely did. When was that? Uh, uh, prior to around the time, my, uh, prior to my dad um, retiring. Prior, prior to 2006? Yes, sir. How long did you explore that? Um, I mean, I, I really, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a solicitor for a long time, but, um, you know, at the time when my dad retired, I was already struggling with pills and I knew I couldn't do it. In 2006? Yes, sir. And we'll talk more about the pills in a bit, but you say you're already struggling with pills in 2006, correct? That's correct. Uh, but over that next 15 years, you still were able to maintain a lucrative law practice. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. And you've already testified that all your law partners had no idea of this pill problem that you had all that time, correct? I'm testifying that I believe, in fact, I'm certain that none of my partners knew I had an addiction. That night of the boat wreck, you say you don't remember put, to putting your badge out, correct? No, I, I don't remember. I don't even remember having my badge. Do you remember going around talking to the kids, the other kids that were on the boat? Yeah, I, I talked to some of them. You remember going to do that? Yes. And was your badge hanging out when you did that as well? You know, I wouldn't think so, Mr. Waters, but like I say, I didn't, I, I don't think so. All right. So it just comes naturally to put your badge out when something like this that you don't even remember why you did that? No, I don't even remember having my badge. And I specifically know that I didn't use the badge. You know, did I mean to do this? I'm not saying that I didn't, but I don't know if I was putting it in my pocket and the flap, you know, you notice that that flap is, is not Velcroed down. It, I, I don't know. I don't have a specific memory of that. And I never went around, you know, acting like I was on official business. So you're so, saying it might be an accident that your badge was hanging out there. I'm saying that I have no memory of that whatsoever. All right. Well, did you ever, you never use these badges as like a wallet, right? No, I did. You did? I did. So you're saying you had your, your credit cards and all your stuff in there? No, sir. Yeah. No, sir. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that on that night. You just asked me if I ever used it as a wallet, and there were times when I used it as a wallet. Were you using it as a wallet that night? 
I don't remember, but I don't think so. I didn't use it as a wallet very often, and I didn't use it as a wallet for very long when I did use it as a right. wallet. So let's see if we can get back to what we agree on. So you would agree that you had to make a conscious decision to grab that badge and when you went into the hospital, correct? Would you agree with that? Yeah, at some point I had to make a conscious decision to pick it up. But you're saying you don't know if you hung it out like that on purpose while you're talking to that law enforcement officer or if it's just an accident that is hanging out of your pocket in full view of everyone. Well, I, I am saying that because that is not how I would normally carry uh, a badge. And even if I wanted to give somebody an impression, to me, that's got kind of an obnoxious look to it. That's just not something that... Uh, I mean, that's not something I would typically do. But I'm, I may have done it that night. I have no memory of that. Okay. All right, so you're saying that just could be an accident that it's hanging out like that? I'm saying it could be, or I could have put it there like that. All right. I don't remember. Did you generally just walk around with it in your pocket? Or would you only carry it when you wanted to use it for something? Uh, no, I wouldn't generally carry it around in my pocket just any time. Okay. All right. All right, so we got the badge that may be accidentally hanging out of your pocket. You won't concede that you did that purposefully. I mean, Mr. Waters, if you want me to say I did that on purpose, I don't have a problem with that. I'm saying I don't remember that, all right? So can I tell you that I did that on purpose? No, sir, I can't. Can I say that, that this happened by accident? No, sir, I can't. What I can say is I don't remember it, and that's not how I would normally, that's just not how I would normally, you know, that's, that's just not, that's not something I did. That's not a normal thing. So I don't know. Okay. All right. That's fine. You but, wouldn't say to this jury that there was any intention or purpose to you doing that at the hospital on the night of the boat wreck. I'm saying I don't remember using that badge. Fair enough. And I specifically remember, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you can ask you. You specifically question. remember what? That I... Like when I, when I went into the room with the kids, did I pull my badge out? And I know that I did not do that. No, because it was on your pocket like that, correct? I, I, it's on my pocket like that right then. Mm -hmm. Did you use that to get into areas that shouldn't be accessed by non-official personnel? No, absolutely not. I mean, there was nowhere that I went that... Um, that was not truly public domain. I mean, basically, the places that I went to were, when I got there, I went to Paw Paw. When I left Paw Paw, I went to Morgan Dowdy, who was like a daughter to Maggie and I, had dated Paul for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I went to Morgan. Um, Morgan had an injury to her hand that, 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 was, that was bad, and she was very upset about Mallory. Um, and they were working on her, so I left her room. I went back to Paw Paw. At some point in time, I know that I went to Connor's room, and I believe those are the only rooms I went to. Did but again, I, I don't, I can't tell you that with certainty. While you're wearing that badge like that, did you tell any, any of the kids who were in the boat wreck not to cooperate with law enforcement? I never told anybody not to cooperate with law enforcement. Whether I had a badge hanging out my pants, mm -hmm. didn't have a badge, any point in time did I tell anybody don't cooperate with law enforcement. Did you become aware in March or April or May of 21, 2021, shortly before June, that an investigation into the investigation of that night had begun, as well as your conduct? Yes, yeah, some I, I did learn I did learn of that. I don't know the status of that uh, investigation, being that I've been charged with so many things and haven't been charged with that. I'm assuming that there may not be charges. Whether or not you were aware that that had begun in the spring of 2021. Yes, sir. I, I was aware. Well, at some point in time, I became aware of it. Was that the spring? Was it, you know, February, March, April? I know it was after. After, um, I, I know it was after that night, 
and it was before June 7. Before June 7. I'm pretty sure that I, I, I already, I'm pretty sure that I already knew that. Did I on June the 7th. You mentioned Andy Strickland. Do you know what happened to him? Do I know what happened to him when? How he lost his job? As sheriff? I believe that when he was charged, I can't, I, I don't know if he resigned or he was um, suspended. Okay. Do you remember if that was a few months prior to you becoming aware of an investigation into the investigation of this boat case, including you? Do, do I know what when Andy now? Strickland was charged and lost his job, was that a few months prior to you becoming aware of the investigation into this incident that's on the screen? A few months prior? Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know this for a fact, but I believe, as I'm sitting here today, I believe that Andy was charged back in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, and, li and like I said, we learned about when, I, I've testified about when I understood there was an investigation into whether or not I was acting in a um, public manner or whatever, whatever it was y'all were investigating, public corruption or, or, or that. So if it was a couple of months, mm -hmm. if it was a month or two when Andy Strickland got charged, mm -hmm. then if, if, I mean, if you showed me that, I'd be, I'd be surprised because I, I, think, I think he was charged before that. But you're, this was a friend of yours, correct? The guy who, who you asked if you could put lights in your car in a private vehicle, correct? Well, I mean, Andy, yeah, I considered Andy a friend. I considered TC a friend, and I considered Tom Carter a friend, sure. all of whom I asked if I could put lights in the vehicle. All right. And so, yes, sir. I mean, and I considered Andy right. a friend. Would you at least agree with me that in at least the fall of 2020, your friend Andy Strickland was indicted and lost his job for a financial and corruption investigation. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Response. Your Honor, I think there's a link between uh, his knowledge of that and what he's admitted that there was an investigation going on uh, in the months prior to the murders. Thanks, further. I mean, the question is something about Andy Strickland being indicted? I just don't see the relevance, Your Honor. I sustain the objection. All right. <clears throat> we can at least agree that you were aware prior to the murders that there was this investigation, correct? The one on the screen. The one related to the boat, the investigation into the boat case. Was I aware that y'all had started an investigation into what I did in the hospital prior to the June the 7th? Yes. I believe that to be correct. All right. And if it wasn't before that, it was shortly after it. You I testified that uh, you've had pill addiction for approximately 20 years, correct? I think that's I think that's about right. And so when did you start stealing money from clients? How long did it take before you started doing that? I'm not sure when the first time I did that is. You don't know? No, sir. Not you have gone back and thought about that? Well, sure, I've thought about it. But to be able to sit here, I mean, you got to understand, I've been in rehab and I've been in jail and I don't have access you know, all my telephone calls were put on the media, so I, I haven't had a lot of phone access. I haven't had a lot of access. So as we sit here today, I cannot tell you the exact time. I don't deny that I did it, but I can't tell you the exact time that I first did it. And you're, you told this jury that's the cause of your financial problems? Did I say that? The 
The drugs. opiate addiction was the cause of your financial problems. It was certainly a cause, yes, A sir. cause. Not the only cause, though, correct? Uh, no, I wouldn't think it was the only cause, but, no. yeah, it was certainly a cause. You recall testimony in this courtroom about uh, how you had some land deals go bad around the time of the recession in 2008-2009? Sure. And you recall testimony from your law partners in this courtroom that you had some big cases that they thought cured those issues, correct? I heard them say that, yes, sir. Do you disagree with that? Do I disagree with what they thought? No, I mean, I don't, I don't have any no, do reason. Do you disagree if that was true? That they thought, that, that, that my partners thought that, um, that I, I gotten past my financial difficulties? I have no reason to dispute that, Mr. Waters. I'm not was trying to frustrate true? you. Was what they thought true? That I was past my financial difficulties? Is that the question? Yes, that's the question. Was it true that I was past my financial difficulties? Um, I mean, they were certainly better after that, but I mean, no, I don't, I don't, no, I don't think I was past them, no, sir. All right. Not what my, was the first big case after the recession that you had? Mr. Waters, I, I, I can't tell you what the first big case was. You remember what, the... What, what date? All right, well, let's go with, uh, the Pinckney case, do you remember when that was? I remember generally speaking when it was, yes, sir. What year was that? 2011, would you, would you dispute that? 2011, what, when it ended? When you got recoveries in that case. I mean, if you're looking at something that tells me that, I have no reason to dispute that. But I can't remember off the top of my head, but that, that's certainly in the time frame. It's fine, Mr. Martin, we'll go through it. Let's do it. <laughs> Mr. Waters, like I said, I, I, I take you at that. I just don't know off the top of my head. All right. I don't have a reason to dispute that. Evidence uh, states 331. Let's go with actually 332, 333, and 334. Do you recognize those documents? Just generally, do you recognize them? I do. All right, and just general, what are those? Those are disbursement sheets. Can I have them back, please? Uh, yes, sir. Just give me oh. one sec. Yeah, take, take your time. Just trying to see which ones. <coughs> I, I, I mean, there's some things about it that I'm curious about, but yeah, we'll you talk ask about that. questions. We'll talk about that. All right. <coughs> Let's talk about, uh, let's start with Natasha Thomas. Do you remember her? I do. How old was she when she became your client? I'm not sure. She was young. She was a teenager? I'm not sure, but I know she was young. She was underage, correct? Uh, yes, she was underage. I do believe that. All right. In fact, I know that. And can you tell me what the, uh, she was injured in, a, in this wreck, with, uh, in an automobile wreck, correct? Yes. And the company Michelin, that was uh, one of the uh, defendants for an alleged tire issue, is that correct? That is correct. All right. And do you remember how much Natasha Thomas got in that particular case? And I can show it to you on 334. Do you remember how much she got? As a gross settlement, I believe it shows yeah. $2, million, $2 million. $2 million. All right. And how much were your or PMPD's fees that would be attributed to you in that for, out of that $2 million? $800,000. $800,000. Yes, sir. All right. Excuse me. Yes, sir. All right. And so that would be $800,000 in fees that would get attributed to you. That has nothing to do with the money that you subsequently stole from that teenager. Correct? The 800000 is different from money that I stole? Yes. That's correct. All right. So you got $800,000 attributed to you with the firm. 
but that was not enough. You also stole money from that teenager. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. When you did that, did you sit down with her much as you sat down with this jury and explain to her what was going on while you were stealing her money? Uh, I, that would be the normal process, but I, I certainly don't remember specifically doing that. That would be the normal process, correct? That would be. It, it may be a little different with a teenager, but certainly, I mean. You would sit down with them across the table and go through these documents, correct? If, if that, that would not be abnormal, yes, sir. All right. And then you would then, try, you would explain to them what was going on and how they were getting everything they were entitled to, correct? If I was the one doing it, yes, sir. And you would look them in the eye while you did that, correct? It wouldn't be unusual for me to look them in the eye. While you were doing some fast talking to a teenager, correct? I certainly was not telling her the truth. I don't know if I was talking fast or slow, but I wasn't telling the truth. All right. Well, you ultimately convinced her that there was nothing amiss here, right, while you were stealing her money, correct? I don't know if I convinced her that nothing was amiss or I misled her, but I admit candidly in all of these cases, Mr. Waters, that I took money that was not mine and I shouldn't have done it. I hate the fact that I did it. I'm embarrassed by it. I'm embarrassed for my son. I'm embarrassed for my family. And I don't dispute that I did it. I, I understand that. And but you so, understand that we have to ask about these things because we've heard about it in a very academic paperwork manner. But every single one of these, you had to sit down and look somebody in the eye and convince them that you were on their side when you were not, correct? That's what you did in every single one of these. I mean, every time. Answer my question, yes or no, and then you can explain. I'll let you explain all day long. Well, I mean, no, sir, that may or may not be true. Okay. And Mr. Waters, just to try to get through this quicker, I admit. I know you want to get through it quicker, but we're not. So answer the question, please. Uh, what, 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 I, what I admit is that I misled them, I did wrong, and that I stole their money. Now, this, this is something, what's the date on that one? I'll bring it back to you. Well, you can tell me. I, I trust you to tell me accurately. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of funny. It doesn't have the date on it, but uh, I'll let you take a look at it. All right, I'm just looking at the date of a check. So that's mm -hmm. December 20th, so that go, uh, 2011. 2011. So that gives us a ballpark. So that's 12 years ago. For me to sit here and tell you specifically that I remember sitting down and talking with Natasha Thomas, I, I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you, and mm -hmm. I can tell you that I didn't do right by Natasha Thomas. I took money from Natasha Thomas that didn't belong to me, and I was wrong for doing that. Okay. And I admit that. All right. And I know, Mr. Murdoch, that you would like for it just to be as simple as that, just to say, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I stole money, and have that be the end of it. But in every single one of these cases, Objection to the comment, Your Honor. You just testified that you would like to just admit that and make this quick correct isn't that what you said isn't that what you implied no sir mr waters you have charged me with murdering my wife and my son and i have sat here for all these weeks listening to all this financial stuff that i did wrong that i'm embarrassed by i'm happy to talk to you about as much of that as you want to talk about i'm required to that. talk about it as much as you want to talk about it but the fact is, is I cannot specifically remember sitting down. The details that you're asking me for, I, I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is that in all these financial situations, I stole money that was not my money. I misled people that I shouldn't have misled, and I did wrong. I can tell you that. And I may be able to tell you specifically in some instances, what I did or didn't do. All right. Well, good. Well, we'll do that. But the point that I'm asking you is, it's, it's not as just as simple as some paperwork. You had to sit down and deal with these people and convince them that you were telling them the truth in order to steal this money. Correct? Th that may not be true because in some situations, I, I may not have had to do that. They may, they may have just trusted me to do it. Okay. So that's my point is I misled them. There's no question about that. But did I sit down in each particular instance and 
like, like you're breaking it down step by step. I can't say that. Right. I can say I did wrong. I stole money that wasn't mine, and I shouldn't have done it. All right. And it was terrible what I did. All right, well, let's look at stage 330. <clears throat> this is uh, Arthur Badger and the EPS case, correct? That's correct. All right. You remember what the total recovery was in that particular case? There were multiple plaintiffs. Let me ask you that first. There were multiple plaintiffs in that case, correct? That's correct. And do you remember what the total recovery was in that case? Not exactly, but I mean, I know generally. All right. Was it $12 million? Would you disagree with that? Was it $12 million? It, I mean, if you tell me it was $12 million, then I believe you, but I thought it was a little bit more than that. All right. And if uh, ultimately, if you have multiple plaintiffs, how do you decide as the plaintiff's lawyer, how does it work out that amounts of that total recovery get allocated to individual plaintiffs? I mean, different cases are different ways. Um, Is it true that often the defense attorneys, the civil defense attorneys, will ask the plaintiff's attorneys how you want that allocated? Um, s sometimes, yeah. Sometimes? Sure. Is that what happened in this case? In the Badger case? I can't remember exactly how we came to that. Who was the, uh, the deep pocket in the Badger case? Do you remember? The, uh, the defendant that had the money that you ultimately recovered from, the vast majority. Do you remember? Well, it was UPS, and I, I, I believe it was, I can't remember if it was corporate or if there was insurance, but it was certainly UPS was the major defendant. But I believe Arthur Badger was a defendant. I can't remember. I know, I know UPS was. Did you sit down with him and explain this paperwork that you were using to steal his money? I believe I did sit down with Arthur Badger. And managed to convince him that nothing was amiss while at the same time stealing money? I believe I did. And did you allocate millions of dollars to Arthur Badger personally while only telling him that his recovery was going to be around $300,000. I believe that I did, yes sir. And on this exhibit, 330 sat down and looked him in the eye with all this stuff in, on here and fast talked him past these figures so that he believed you and left thinking that you had done him right. I would have I, I, did, did that, I believe that I sat down with Arthur Badger and I know that I misled Arthur Badger and I'm sure at some point during that conversation that I looked him in the eye. All right. Going back to uh, States 333, <clears throat> you remember Hakeem, Hakeem Pinckney? Do you remember him? I do. What happened to him? Um, he was injured in the same wreck that Natasha Thomas was injured in. Was he badly injured? He was. How badly injured was he? Yes, I mean, he was terribly injured. He became a, um, I can't remember what level, but he was a quadriplegic. Do you remember what the uh, total recovery amount was for him? Not off the top of my head, no, sir. All right, well, let me show you states 333 and see what the total, if you recall, what the total recovery was in that case. It looks like it was $10,245,000. And that was for Hakeem, correct? That's correct. And how much of that was the attorney's fees that would have gone to PMPD that would have been attributable to you? Uh, Four million. $98,000. million in legal fees that you would have gotten from this settlement, is that correct? $4,098,000, yes sir. And in the end, that wasn't enough for you, correct? Was that enough for you? Was that enough for me in that case? Yeah. I mean, it was four million over four million dollars in legal fees that you received uh, that would have been attributable to you through the law firm at the end of the year, whatever it worked out to be, but you would have been credited with over four million in fees for that. Is that correct? That's correct. And was that enough for you? 
Was that enough for me? Mm -hmm. Or did you take more? Oh no, from I, 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 I took monies from Hakeem Pinckney that, I, that did not belong to me that I should not have taken. Been rendered a paraplegic. No, sir, he was a quadriplegic, quadriplegic. unfortunately. Thank you for correcting me. Yes, sir. You ultimately take money from his mother, Pamela, as well. I believe that I did. You remember how much money you took from from a king? No, sir. Not off the top of my head. I do not. If I told you it was over three hundred and seventy thousand dollars, would you agree with that? If, if if that's what the record show, I don't dispute that. Do you remember how much you took from the teenager Natasha Thomas in addition to your legal fees? Not off the top of my head, no, sir. If I told you it was over three hundred fifty thousand dollars, would you agree with that? I don't dispute it. Do you remember how much you took from Arthur Badger? Not off the top of my head, no, sir. If it was over $1.3 million, would you agree with that? I don't dispute it. No. Around the time that this was going on, did you have some land deals that were going bad? That had gone bad? Which? 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011? I, I think that they, I think those had happened a little bit before that, but I, I had some land deals that, that, you know, had certainly had problems. And, <clears throat> That had something to do with the money you were taking as well, did it not? I think the whole picture had things to do with me doing stuff I shouldn't have done. I mean, I, I, I would agree that, I mean, that, that certainly would have played some role in it. Were you living a <clears throat> wealthy lifestyle? A wealthy lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Probably. I, I mean, we were living whatever lifestyle, pr probably. Would you characterize your lifestyle as wealthy? You know, that's not, that's not how I would characterize it. But you wouldn't I, characterize I'm not gonna, it as wealthy? I'm not going to take issue with it. Okay. Around this time, were you making more than a million dollars a year? Around what time? 2011. Yes. 2012? Yes. And you were still stealing money as well, correct? Yes. Can we at least agree that that's a lot of money? Over a million mind. dollars? Never mind, it's fine. Okay. I think there's no question that's a lot of money. Okay, good. We can agree on that. That's a lot of money, correct? I, I feel like we're struggling here. Is it, were you living a wealthy lifestyle? Jackson, the statement, you know. Were you living a wealthy lifestyle i just don't know what you mean by wealthy you is know this a hard question mr murdoch well it, it, it's it's hard for me to know exactly what you want you know um and, and it depends i was spending money that i sh that, that wasn't mine mm -hmm. that i shouldn't have i think that you know we lived a a, a lifestyle I, I don't i don't have an issue if you want to call it wealthy would you concede with me that not all of this money was going to pills at this point in time? No. All this stolen money? No, I, I doubt that it was. Okay. And it was being used to support your wealthy lifestyle? Well, I haven't looked at all these documents to know exactly what was being spent where, but here's what I do know. I know that I was making a bunch of money, and I should have had... I should have had uh, more money than I did. And I know that I was spending a bunch of money on pills. And I know that, 
you know, I just, I don't remember in 2011 if those land, I just can't remember those land deals, but, you know, if, if I spent money on other things, I don't dispute that either. I just haven't looked at the records. Okay. But you would at least concede that the money you were stealing was going to support your ever-expanding wealthy lifestyle. Would you concede that? Did all of the money I stole? Any of it, Mr. Murdoch. Any of it? Yeah, I would certainly agree that okay. there was money that, that didn't go to buy just pills. All right, and you would concede that even though you were generating millions of dollars in fees, that was not enough for you. Would you concede that? If, if by concede that, you mean was I also stealing money that I shouldn't have? Yes, sir, I agree with that. I've said that repeatedly. Who were the plowers? They were two young girls from uh, Columbia. They were underage when they became your clients? Yes, sir. Did they suffer a loss in their family as a result of an accident? They did. Who, who, what loss did they suffer? Who died? Uh, their mother. Their mother did. And did you get a sizable recovery in the case, in that, in that particular case related to that? Yes, sir. Do you remember how much that recovery was? I don't. Got any idea? Mm, I know it was a significant settlement. I know it was a very good settlement, but... Millions of dollars? Oh, yeah. It was millions of dollars. But whether it was, you know, two million, I, I, I know it was significant. I, I, I don't know if it was eight figures, but I know it was a significant settlement. All right. And was there a conservatorship for them because they were underage? There was a conservatorship um, for them, but I don't think the fact that they were underage is why there was a conservatorship. You don't think it was because, in, at least in part, they were underage when the settlement was received? No, that, that's not what I. That's not what I remember. But I, for purposes of, of of your thing, Mr. Waters, I agree there was a conservator appointed. Well, what is your memory of why that the conservator was appointed? My memory is is that the father in this case who was the beneficiary or, or a big beneficiary in this and who was the PR of the mother's a case was an undesirable witness. Mm -hmm. And there was testimony that he had, it was testimony that he had hit his wife. Um, and it was clear we felt like we didn't, we didn't want him to be the face of the lawsuit, so we appointed a conservator. Who was that? For that purpose is would, why I believe we appointed a conservator. Okay, and who was that? That was Russell Lafitte. At Palmetto State Bank? Yes, sir. And after that, <coughs> did you get Russell Lafitte to start loaning you money from the Plowler Girls account that he was conservator for? He loaned me money from the Plyler account. I don't know if I got him to do that. Oh, you didn't talk to him about it? Y'all didn't talk about that at all? No, I, uh, we did talk about it. I mean, I mean, there's emails to that effect. Are you disputing that to this jury? Mr. Waters, I'm not disputing. I'm just telling you that Russell Lafitte gave me a loan from the Plylers. Your question was, did I get him to do that? And I don't necessarily believe that to be accurate. Well, who came up with the idea? Uh, I don't know that it was come up with an idea. There was, mm -hmm. um, I think that Russell felt like that it was uh, a sound investment for those girls to charge me a higher interest rate when they weren't getting but so much interest somewhere else. So. What was that interest rate that y'all thought was such a good idea for these girls? Do you recall I, what it was? I can't remember. The reality is, is that you needed the money, and this was a convenient source to keep your massive cash flow going as early as 2011, 2012. Isn't that correct? Well, this was a loan, yes, sir. But w exactly why it came from them versus the bank, mm -hmm. I, I can't, I, I don't, 
I can't tell you the details without looking at all that. I can't tell you that off the top of my head. And despite all you were earning, you would even send Russell emails saying, hey, transfer over 75000 from the Plotter account into my account, correct? You remember emails to that effect that you would have to him? Do I remember an email to that effect? No, I don't remember would you that. Dispute but I, that there were emails to that effect? Not if you say there were, Mr. Waters. I, I don't dispute that. I, I don't dispute any of this that I took money that didn't belong to me, that I misled people. I know that you want the answer to be that simple. That's not what I'm asking. We, we agree on that. We agreed on that. Well, no, sir. I, I, I don't necessarily want the answer to be simple. I just want everybody to understand. I do not dispute that I stole money that was not my money, that I misled people to do that, that I misled people that trusted me to do that, and that what I did was terrible. I don't dispute that. It's just the way you're asking these questions, and, you know, I mean, there's some things in there that I do take issue with. Okay. Which part of what I just asked you about the pliers do you take issue with? You take issue that y'all didn't conspire to do that, you and Russell? You yes. take issue with that? You take issue with that. Okay. I, I can tell you that Russell Lafitte, Russell Lafitte never conspired with me to do anything. Whatever was done was done by me. Okay. So you told the Plowler girls that you were borrowing money from their account? That... No, nah, I don't know. I don't I don't know that I that I, I told them that. Russell to tell them? I, I, I don't, I don't recall. I don't, I, I don't believe so, but I don't, I can't sit here and tell you what I told him however many years ago. Did you tell Russell he could borrow money from that account too? Uh, I, I don't remember having any discussion with him about him borrowing money. Was the supposed interest rate you were paying far lower than anything you could have gotten anywhere else? I don't even know what you interest rate know. I was paying. Okay. One but thing's clear, you never told this to the Plowler girls, did you? I would have thought the interest rate that I was paying was a little bit more mm -hmm. than what a bank loan would have been, but I don't know that. I, I don't know that to be, I don't know what the interest rate was, so I, I don't know that for sure. When you stole the Badger money, how much did you steal from Arthur Badger that we talked about before in the UPS case? I don't remember the exact amount. Over $1.3 million? Would you dispute that? I don't dispute. I don't dispute that. And that was in addition to the $1.2 million in attorney's fees for his case alone that would have been attributed to you through the firm? What I stole from Arthur Badger Let me ask you this. inappropriately mm -hmm. was in addition to any fees that I legitimately earned. I shouldn't have stolen money from Arthur Badger. I misled him, and I was wrong. Did you speak with Russell Lafitte once you stole this money from Arthur Badger about structuring that $1.3 million that you stole in a manner so it appeared to be payments to the Plyler account. Do you understand the question? No, sir. Say that again. Did you have any conversations with Russell Lafitte about structuring this $1.3 million into multiple payments and then applying it to the Plyler account? I, I've, I've heard the testimony and I've seen some of I'm those asking records. If you did. Did you have any conversations with Russell about that? I, I had to. Okay. I had to have. All right. You even asked him to recut the check, correct? To have Jeannie recut the check. I've seen, I've seen, a, I believe, an email or a text to that effect. So you don't dispute that? No, I don't dispute that. What I dispute is if, if you're insinuating in any way, this was stuff that I did. Okay. I mean, Thank this you. stuff, that I, I did these things wrong. Russell Lafitte didn't do anything I'm not here to and, talk and about what, that. I'm just talking about but, what went on. And I, I know, but you keep talking about what I did with Russell Lafitte. And what I want to let you know is that I did this. I know. And I'm the one that took people's money that I shouldn't have taken and that Russell Lafitte was not involved in helping me do that. I just asked you a Knowingly. Question. If he did it, he did it without knowing it. All right. So you sent him an email and then asked him to recut the check. 
and have the check made out to various amounts short of that and then applied those over time to give the illusion of payments to the Plyler account. Is that correct? Mr. Waters. Is that correct? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. Okay, I you don't, don't dispute. I don't dispute what's in those uh, emails as far as or texts as far as what I told Russell and as far as what I did uh, to, to, again, take money that didn't belong to me, that wasn't mine, and that I was wrong for taking. It's just the specifics of that you want me to give you details on, and I can't do that. I do not dispute what's in those texts or emails. And <clears throat> did you steal that Badger money because you had to pay back the Plyler girls' money before they turned 18 and reached the age of majority? And Russell would then have to be held to account for that money that he had loaned to himself and to you. First off, I don't know anything about any money that Russell loaned to himself. I only know about what he loaned to me. And I don't specifically, I don't believe that me stealing Arthur Badger's money and taking that money that did not belong to me, that I wrongly took, had anything to do. I don't remember it having a relationship with having to pay back a loan or there being some time pressure to pay back a loan that he gave me on the Plyler conservatorship. You don't remember that. No, and I'm not saying that that didn't happen. I'm saying that I don't rem that's not the way I remember it and I don't remember it. Did you ultimately borrow a million dollars roughly from the Plyler girls without their knowledge? A Does million? that sound right? About a million dollars in total? Um, if, if you tell me that's the number, I mean, that surprises me, but I don't dispute what's in the records. But I didn't believe I had a loan for, are you saying a million dollars? I didn't believe that I had a in loan. Total. Mr. Waters, if that's what the records say, I don't dispute it, but that's not what I thought. I didn't think I had a, a million dollar loan from them. But a, a, if that's what the records say, I don't dispute that. But I can tell you this, if I had a million dollar loan from them, um, I, I, I don't remember that. And I may, have, I may be confusing it with what a loan from the bank. Um, but again, if that's what's in the records, I don't dispute it. All right. So <clears throat> you have no memory whatsoever. And so for all you know, it's just a coincidence that the Plowers were about to turn 18 when you stole this Badger money and you applied a significant amount of it to pay that off before they turned 18. You don't have any memory of that. No, I can tell you that that was never, that, that was never an issue or motivation for me, again, taking Arthur Badger's money that I shouldn't have taken, that didn't belong to me, and that I was wrong for, um, I, I, I don't remember a loan from the Plyler conservatorship as being motivation for that. So for all you can remember, it's just a coincidence. Why I stole Arthur Badger's money just being a no, coincidence? No, why you applied it to the Plyler loans right before they turned 18. No, I, I, I'm not saying is a coincidence or not a coincidence. What I'm saying is I don't remember that. Okay. And so I don't remember that being a motivation. If it was, I just, I, I, I didn't know I had a million dollar loan from the Plyler conservatorship, um, at least as I sit here today. But, you know, I would have known I had a loan from somewhere and if I took Arthur Badger's money and applied it to that, I mean, again, I stole money that didn't belong to me. I misled Arthur Badger to take that money, and I was wrong. How many times have you practiced that answer before your testimony today? Because I've keep never the same one over and over again. I've never practiced that answer, but okay. you keep asking me these questions, and... I keep using that answer. 
Let me show you what's been entered in evidence as to as states 321. <coughs> you recognize generally that document. I do. And what is that? This is the disbursement sheet on the Dion Martin case. Right. What happened to Dion Martin? He got in a wreck. Do you know his family? When he got in the wreck? Prior to him getting in the wreck. Um, I, I knew who his family was but prior to getting in the wreck, but after he got in this wreck, I became very close with his family. Became very close with his family. And Dion suffered some pretty severe injuries, correct? Uh, Dion was hurt bad. Yes. Including, including an injury to his head. Um, you know, I heard you say that the other day. I don't specifically remember Dion having a um, head injury. I believe Dion had more orthopedic injuries, but he may have had some injury to his head. You met with him on a number of occasions? I, yes, I met with him on a number of occasions. You met with his parents on a number of occasions? About Dion? About the case, while the case was going on. I don't know if I met with his parents about Dion's case, but I know I met with Dion, and I may have met with his parents, if, right. if they say that. I, I, I mean, his just, dad's became, one of the most honorable fellows that I know. If he says I met with him, I certainly believe that. But you said you became close with them, correct? Close became, with the parents? Um, I, I consider Dion's, yes, I consider... I think the world of his dad and his mom and Dion. <clears throat> what was the uh, recovery that was obtained in Dion's case? I'll show it to you. Let's see, it looks like uh, recovery, mm -hmm. two, two million dollars. Actually, this is, um, <coughs> See, I know it was $2 million, but I believe the recovery was less than $2 million. I believe the recovery was less than $2 million. I believe that I said it was $2 million. I can't remember exactly what the recovery is, but I know it was less than $2 million, mm -hmm. and I know that I misstated it as two million dollars so you falsified the paperwork correct it, it it appears that i put inaccurate information on the paperwork yes sir you put inaccurate information you falsified it right if you like that word yes sir all right and that's that right there where you put that five hundred thousand dollars on there correct right oh i'm sorry can i have the elmer please I'm sorry, Mr. Waters, what, what was the question? Let's get the Elmo up and then I'll show you. Right there, that's the $500,000 that you falsified this document with, is that correct? Where it says structured annuity directly to Michael Gunn? Uh, yeah, that looks like one place that I Yes. Why did you do that? Why did I? Yeah, why'd you put why that 500000 What was your purpose in doing that? It appears that I was stealing his money, $500,000. Were you not inflating your fees with that one? I mean, I... You, you don't remember? I, I know that I inflated the fees like I just talked about, but I believe what, go back to that top of that thing, I believe what I must have done with the structured annuity is I had that $500,000 check, and I must have had that made to, uh, I must have had that made to forge, as you've heard, to steal that money from Dion Martin. All right, down at the bottom. That I shouldn't have. Is that your signature down there? 
It mm -hmm. is. Is that Dion Martin's signature on the other side? It. You dispute that? No, I don't dispute that. So you would have sat down with Dion Martin and gone over this, this document with him and convinced him that there was nothing to miss here? You know, again, I don't know if I went over the document with him or not, but I certainly misled Dion Martin. I certainly lied to Dion Martin. I certainly took money from Dion Martin that did not belong to me, and I shouldn't have done it. You don't specifically remember talking to Dion. There was nothing in you that causes you to remember talking with Dion, sitting there with this document in front of him, as you looked him in the eye, knowing that you were lying to him the whole time. You don't even remember that? Nothing in you that causes you to remember that? To specifically remember? I'm not sure that I did sit down with Dion Martin. Okay. Um, but I certainly, Mr. Waters, I misled Dion Martin. I lied to Dion Martin. I took Dion Martin's money when I shouldn't have. Well, let me ask you this. Of all the people on here, all these exhibits, do you have any independent recollection of a time where you sat down and looked that person in the eye and you were lying to them and, and convincing them that everything was okay while you stole their money? Do you remember it, even one of them? I'm sure I do. Okay, well, tell us about one. I, I mean, you have to show me. You have to give me. I'm asking you if you remember one time where you're sitting there in your heart looking somebody in the eye knowing you're stealing from them and you remember it. I remember stealing from people, I remember lying to people, and I remember misleading people. For me to tell you that I sat down with each one of these people... Um, I'm asking you to tell me about just one conversation, one time where you recall looking somebody in the eye and convincing them with your lies that nothing was amiss. One conversation. There were plenty of conversations where I looked people in the eye and I lied to them. There were plenty of times where I took money that I shouldn't have taken. There were plenty of times where I stole money. For me to sit and tell you a specific time that I sat down with a specific document and what exactly was said, if you ask me questions, but I, I, can't, I can't remember sitting down with Dion. On a they certainly remember it, don't they, Mr. Murdoch? I don't know if they do or not, but I would assume so. But you can't tell us one time where it just sticks out in your memory, where you're like, I'm pulling a fast one right now. Oh, no. Or anything, whatever reaction you had. You oh, can't no. remember a single one? No, sir, that's not correct. I can remember a lot of times where I lied to my clients, I misled my clients, and I stole money from my clients in conversations. But for me to sit and tell you that I had a conversation about this particular document, I don't dispute it. I know you don't dispute it, Mr. Murray. You've said that a hundred times, haven't you? But you can't recall for this jury one of these people looking them in the eye while you lied to them. You can't recall a single one. I've asked you this three times now. Oh, I promise you. Answer. Your Honor, ask and answer three times. Well, here, here. <laughs> here. Here you go, Ms. Mr. Waters. Made, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? I, I, I don't know if your point's made or not, but okay. here, here's, here's... You don't know that either, do you? Here's what I will say again. I remember lying to clients of mine. Mm -hmm. I did it on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. I took their money when I shouldn't have taken it. I'm sure that I looked them in the eye. I'm sure that I misled them. But I can't tell you exactly when those occurred 12 years ago is the only point. I don't dispute that they occurred. I don't dispute that everything about what I did was wrong. Okay. But I can't sit and tell you the specific details that you're wanting me to give you. We could just write that answer down on a sheet of paper and you could hold it up each time you want to say that, couldn't you, Mr. Murray? If, if, if that's what you want to do, Mr. Waters, but I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. All right. These were real people you were dealing with, right? Absolutely. They were, I, you know I what? know you want to give that answer, but these were real people, aren't they? No, nah, they're very real people. And, you know, one of the saddest parts of this whole thing is, is, you know, they're people that I, I, I still care about, and I did them this way.
You know, that's what I was meaning in that text that you made the issue about to Annette Griswold and, and, and it was a lot talking about my partners, but it was a lot talking about these people. I mean, I know the people that I did wrong and that I hurt and that I stole from. I mean, they're people that I think a lot of. And, they didn't know hang on, hang on, I, I want to say one more thing. And okay. there's no question that the actions that I did the things that I did wrong hurt a lot of the people that I care about the most. And I did a lot of damage. And I wreaked a lot of ha havoc. That a lot I'm, of damage wreaked a lot of havoc. I hear you. There's no All question right, about it. Let me uh, show you what's been marked as States 315. See if you recognize this. <laughs> I do. Which case is this? This <coughs> is Elise Mallory. And what happened in this case? I stole her money. What happened, though, with the underlying case? Can you tell the jury that? Do you remember that? Um, I believe Ms. it was Miss Taylor, uh, Miss Mallory's. I believe it was her daughter. It might have been her granddaughter, but I believe it was her daughter. Mm -hmm. Was uh, in a wreck. Did she die? And she got killed. And Miss Mallory came to you for help. She did. You remember that one I at do. all? I okay. Remember. okay, we remember one now. Oh no, Mr. Waters, I remember all of these people. Okay. I, it's not that I don't remember them. Uh -huh. You're just asking me details about conversations. Okay, great. I, I, I can promise you, I remember all of these people that I did wrong. All right, and you stole all of the money, didn't you? I, st I, st I stole all, of, all of the money. Most, most of the money that I've been accused of stealing, I stole. No, I mean, you stole every single dime of the recovery. She didn't get one dime. Isn't that right? I have to look at the records, but if you that's You credited right. yourself with legal fees, and then you stole all the rest of the money, correct? I, I don't dispute that. If, all right. If you tell me about, that. First of all, tell me about Miss Malley. So she lost her daughter, correct? Is that correct? That is correct. And she came to you for help. Daughter, is that correct? granddaughter, but all right. one. All right. And she came to you for help, correct? Yes, sir, I agree with you on that. Very, very sweet lady, correct? Very sweet lady. All right. Tell me about your conversation when you looked her in the eye and lied to her while you were stealing every dime of the money. That's, this is a perfect example, Mr. Waters. I stole her money. I did her wrong. But I don't even believe that Elise Mallory was there when I stole that money. I don't, if you look at that disbursement sheet, there's, I, I, I don't even believe I ever sh showed that to her. You don't remember having any conversations with her when you lied with her about this case while you were stealing all her money? I don't think I did in this case. I don't think I had any meetings with her. I think I stole her money, and I don't believe that I had a meeting with her. See, again, you can't tell us one conversation you have with any of these people when you look them in the eye and convince them that you were doing them right, that you were telling the truth. That's not true, Mr. Waters. I remember a lot of those conversations. I remember a lot of them. All right, he, you just testified you remember a lot of them. I've been asking you now for the past 10 minutes to tell me about one of them where it's stuck in your heart. There are a lot it's of stuck in your brain. There are a lot of conversations I had where I misled my clients and I stole their money where they trusted me. And I remember them. Okay. So but you can, keep, again, can you tell me one? Tell me how it went down, what you said, how you convinced them? How you looked them in the eye, how you made them believe, how you used your skills as a trial lawyer to convince them. Can you just tell me about one of those? What was going through your head when you did it? Your Honor, objection under Rule 403. We've been going over and over and over this. Objection was overruled. All right. What's your question, Mr. Waters? Can you tell me about one of the conversations you had with all of these people? Just one. I can tell you, you what was going me. through your head and how it went down when you sat there and looked them in the eye and convinced them that you were doing them right while you were lying to them and stealing their money. Yes, sir. I had a lot of conversations with a lot of my clients that I cared about. And so 
I, I will tell you that I had conversations with them where I misled them and I lied to them and I took their money. And um, that was a, a, a number of times. Okay. But you're asking me. Just one specific one, Mr. Murdoch? Every single, every single one of these clients I would have had conversations with it's, at some it's point. Fine, it's but fine. this it's particular, fine. like Mr. Waters, that disbursement sheet, I didn't have, there was never a sit down with Ms. Mallory about the dispersing the money. You don't recall talking to her about the status of her case and telling her lies and convincing her that you were on her side? You don't remember that? No, I definitely remember that, but that's not what you Tell asked me, me. I had numerous conversations with Ms. Mallory, you know, about this case. But the fact is, is you were asking me about me sitting down with this disbursement sheet, looking her in the eye and convincing her. And, and I'm telling you that that didn't happen in this case. Right. Now, I had a lot of conversations with her where I misled her, Mr. Waters, where I lied to her. Um, Tell me about one. About. Tell me how it went down. Where. Just, um, we're going to recess for the day and resume at 9.30. Tomorrow morning, everyone remain seated while the jury leaves. Please do not discuss the case. Uh, we'll see you all 9.30 tomorrow morning. Um, Before we adjourn for the day. Uh, State, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Uh, Your Honor, we have um, two experts we brought in. Basically, one of them last night, and another one came in today from out of state. They're not complicated. One's a pathologist. His testimony would perhaps take 30 to 45 minutes on direct. I don't believe there's going to be much cross. The other one is a, a crime scene analyst who's testifying not about the whole crime scene but specifically based on the pathologist's testimony about what happened in the feed room. Total, they should not take more than two and a half hours. I wonder, since this apparently is going to go on for a while, if we might put them up tomorrow, um, either first thing in the morning or at the morning break, as uh, Mr. Waters I can do, and get them out of here. Um, because I believe his cross is probably going to go into Monday anyway at the rate we're going. Um, it's, just, it's just an accommodation. They're not controversial. They're not going to opine on who killed who, when, and how, just the, the mechanics of what happened. What says the state? Your Honor, I, and I think the defense would have to concede. I've been very as accommodating as I can throughout this, but I do not want to interrupt my cross. They, they took a very long time today, and the state's entitled to the same consideration without interruption. Can you project how many more hours you have? <laughs> well, I I'm actually didn't think it would take this long to get this far, um, but I think uh, I've got some more financial to move through, and then we'll get to the other evidence. Two so hours, four hours, six I'm hours. I'm so bad at that, <laughs> Your Honor. Three, four, something like that. And if, if that's out at the outside, right. so perhaps tomorrow afternoon we could Your Honor, get to one or two. Yeah. We could probably do this fairly quickly. If you're honored, um, just leave that door open. I'm going to keep them here. But if I have to keep them here over the weekend, the financial um, impact of that is huge. Um, I understand the, the dilemma, but I, I'm not going to require the state to um, break up the cross-examination uh, of this witness. Well, and again, you know, as I sit here and listen to this, I could have sworn this was a murder case. Um, for two hours now, we haven't heard the word murder once. Um, and, and not criticizing the strategy, obviously denigrating his character is what this is about, but really not relevant to the issue of whether he killed him. Credibility is an issue in, as it relates to all witnesses in every case. The world adjourned until 9.30 tomorrow morning.